All right, I guess we're ready. <coughs> the Health Subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> the Chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. One year ago today, April 30th, 2014, the Energy and Commerce Committee embarked on an ambitious bipartisan goal to develop legislation that would bring the medical innovation cycle of discovery, development, and delivery into the 21st century and speed better treatments and hopefully more cures to patients who desperately need them. Since then, this subcommittee has held over a dozen hearings and roundtables to educate members on topics ranging from modernizing clinical trials to personalized medicine to digital health care to incorporating patient perspective into the development and regulatory decision-making process. We have heard from government, academia, patients, providers, manufacturers, and stakeholders from across the spectrum. The consensus was clear. We can and must do more to help patients in need and to maintain our nation's role as the biomedical innovation capital of the world. Informed by the continued outpouring of feedback and constructive criticism from stakeholders across the spectrum, we have worked tirelessly on a bipartisan basis to develop the second discussion draft that was released yesterday. While it remains a work in progress, it is the product of good faith negotiations and a significant step forward in this process. While increasing accountability, this legislation would invest in the basic research so critical to equipping our nation's best and brightest with the tools they need to discover the underpinnings of disease. It would streamline the development of new therapies and technologies which have, has become increasingly challenging and resource intensive, and it would foster a dynamic, continuously learning healthcare delivery system. Work continues on several complicated yet critical issues, including the regulation of diagnostic tests and telemedicine. With respect to diagnostics, we remain absolutely committed to developing a modernized regulatory framework for these innovative and increasingly important tests and services. Understanding this is a particularly unique and complex endeavor. We look forward to working in a deliberative manner over the coming weeks with Dr. Schoen and stakeholders to advance legislation. On telemedicine, I continue to work with my colleagues in the Energy and Commerce Working Group on telemedicine towards a bipartisan proposal that will encourage the use of telemedicine services to improve health care quality and outcomes, increase patient access, and control cost. I want to thank the administration and CBO for their input and look forward to our continued collaboration moving forward. On that note, I would like to specifically thank our three witnesses today for their assistance throughout this process and their testimony today. And I yield one minute to Dr. Burgess at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to thank you for holding the hearing today. Laudable goals in the 21st century cures, but at the end of the day, it is all about patients. Doctors, of course, want to heal. And the good news is, I really do feel like we're entering into a golden age of medicine. I think that the doctors who are in medical school today will have tools at their disposal to alleviate human suffering that no generation of doctors has ever known. And it is the work of this subcommittee that is, uh, that is bringing that possible. I do have a number of proposals in the newly released draft, and I look forward to discussing those proposals with our agencies today. Um, all of these things can be helpful in speeding the development of new therapies and getting the needed information into the hands of health professionals. I do want to highlight, since 2009, we spent $28 billion to drive adoption of electronic health records, yet patient health data continues to be fragmented and difficult to access for health care providers and for patients themselves. So I'm glad to have the Chairman's continued support in this area. I'll yield the balance of the time to the Vice Chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you. And I think we're also pleased to see this legislation coming forward and to discuss it with you. One of the purposes is to spur innovation and to look for cures to help individuals with disease management and to focus on those outcomes, kind of shift the focus of where we're going a little bit. I uh, think of it as our moonshot. President Kennedy didn't say we are going to go increase NASA's budget and go to the moon. He said we're going to the moon, and that indeed he did. So this is where we are aiming to increase these cures and opportunities. And I thank you for your time. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Green. Five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank all our colleagues for being here today. I want to particularly thank our witnesses and their colleagues for their expertise for the countless hours of work they put in to help us in this effort. It's been one year since the 21st Century Cures Initiative was launched by our colleagues, uh, Chairman Upton and Congresswoman DeGette. Yesterday's release of the discussion draft marked a continued progress toward boosting research and delivering hope to patients. FDA approved treatments are the global gold standard for safety and effectiveness. It's what physicians, patients, and families trust when making decisions about their health. Health. Recently, Congress has enacted additional tools like breakthrough designation for drugs to facilitate development and effective innovation, innovative treatments. The NIH, the world's national leading bio research institution, is one of the great success stories of the federal government. Our investment in basic and translational uh, research has led to advances that have profoundly improved the health and quality of the lives of millions of Americans. The 21st Century Cures Initiative nobly asked for what more can Congress do to further the public and private efforts to address today's most difficult science ch scientific challenges and advance our health care system. Additional funding for NIH is tantamount to this effort. It's so important that the initiatives include increased funding for NIH both through reauthorization and $10 billion over five years in mandatory funding. On the regulatory side, the draft includes policies to incorporate the patient perspective in development process, facilitate the use of biomarkers, break down barriers to collaboration and data sharing. The draft also includes provisions to modernize clinical trials. I want to particularly highlight the ADAPT Act, which Congressman Shimkus and I are working on to provide a streamlined approval and pathway for the next generation of antibiotics. FDA and Dr. Woodcock in particular has been an incredible partner on this issue. I want to thank the agency for their continued commitment in the global crisis of antibiotic resistance. We're working hard to incorporate feedback and we'll have a new draft of the ADAPT to share in a few days. The draft also includes a new version of the Software Act, which I've been working with Congresswoman Blackburn uh, for a couple of Congresses. Um, this provision will provide clarity for developers of software products used in health management and care. Dr. Shuren and his uh, colleagues at the FDA have been instrumental to this effort, and I look forward to continuing to work with you to foster innovation, provide regulatory certainty, and promote fa patient safety. The draft recognizes the importance of improving the interoperability health of IT systems, interoperability and fundamental in realizing the goals of the 21st Century Cures Initiative. An interoperable health care system can advance and facilitate research and dramatically improve patient care and safety. I thank my colleagues for their commitment. The, draft, the, the Cures draft is a work in progress. There's a lot of work left to do, but we will continue to move forward and iron out policies to advance our health care system and live up to the goals of the 21st Century uh, Cures Initiative. And again, I want to thank our witnesses, and I'd like to remain, uh, yield the remainder of my time to Congresswoman DeGette. Thank you so much. In the years since Chairman Upton and I announced this 21st Century Cures effort, I've constantly been impressed by the engagement and consensus of people across the healthcare landscape. From the beginning, we sought suggestions from everyone, and we've worked diligently to reflect those ideas in the discussion draft we have before us. I also want to add my heartfelt thanks to everybody, both in this room and across the country, who have helped Chairman Upton, myself, and all of the members of this committee work to deliver treatments and cures for patients. The draft makes important improvements to our biomedical research system and our process for assessing and improving new therapies, drugs, and devices for patients. After years of resource erosion and cuts, we deliver important new resources to the National Institutes of Health.
We place the patient perspective at the heart of the FDA's drug approval process. We will develop disease registries to pool information and help researchers drill into the unique and sometimes subtle needs of patient populations. We'll help new scientists begin their careers in research so that our great minds tackle great biomedical challenges. Any of these ideas would be worth doing on their own. But frankly, this committee's ambitions stretch across the century. And so we want to do everything we can to improve the process of discovering, developing, and delivering new biomedical advances. So in that spirit, as you can see, we have a great deal more work to do. This discussion draft has brackets around many sections of text, and we have many, much more work to do. But it's certainly not through lack of trying on all of our parts over the last year. One specific issue that deserves singling out is the fact that we're asking FDA to make many changes to its current operation. We need to make sure that the agency has the resources to carry out these duties. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. I want to thank Chairman Upton. And I, I, um, I want to just reflect back to the time when we made that kind of hokey video launching this effort. But we've made tremendous progress. We have a lot more to do, and in that spirit, I want to thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Upton, Chairman Pitts, Mr. Pallone, Mr. Green, all of the staff. It's really, it's really been a great effort, and I look forward to moving along this road so that we can actualize this important, important piece of legislation. Thank Chair, you. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. And now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here today. These two little girls, my friends Brooke and Brielle from Matawan, Michigan, served as an inspiration for the 21st Century Cures. They're battling SMA, and they are two of the brightest stars that I know. Their motto is, we can and we will. At our very first 21st Century Cure Roundtable last spring, I commented that I think that we can all agree that we can always be doing more to help biomedical innovation. We've come a long way, yes we have, but those words still hold true. In fact, since our launch a year ago today, we have heard from our colleagues in the Senate, and yes, they are interested in these same goals, and President Obama even included precision medicine as part of the State of the Union address in January. There is clearly an opportunity to make a real difference. And we, all of us here, have traveled the country to listen to as many stakeholders as we could to get more knowledge to make this bill as, as solid as we can. At that first round table in this room last year, we asked what steps can Congress take to accelerate the discovery development delivery cycle in the U.S. to foster innovation bring new treatments and cures to patients, and keep more jobs in the U.S. The bipartisan discussion draft that was released yesterday makes meaningful investments and still will be fully paid for, includes a number of policies that seek to answer those same questions. We started this journey because all of us know patients and families who are desperate for hope. We've also seen and read about the incredible advances made in science, as well as in technology. But it has become increasingly clear in recent years that our regulatory policies have not kept pace with innovation and there is much more that we can do to be doing to provide that hope to folks. And that's what this bill does. This discussion draft, the product of eight hearings, more than two dozen roundtables and hundreds of discussions, number of white papers, incorporates the patient perspective into the regulatory process. It will increase funding for the NIH. It modernizes clinical trials, including allowing for more flexible trial design so that we can customize trials based on the unique characteristics of patients most likely to benefit 21st century cures. will unlock the wealth of health data available to patients, researchers, and innovators, and can communicate and keep the cycle of cures constantly moving and improving. We still have important issues to resolve over the next couple of weeks. One placeholder included in the draft is on rescuing and repurposing drugs for serious and life-threatening diseases and disorders. As we move through the process 
to markup will continue to work on a policy to provide incentives to develop drugs that while they may have failed in trials for one indication, show promise to treat patients facing other serious or life-threatening diseases. We need to ensure the scientific promise to help patients play a more important role in patients in drug development. This policy will include incentives for doing research on drugs that are FDA approved but can be repurposed to help patients with different types of illnesses. On the important issue of diagnostics, we remain committed to developing a modernized regulatory framework for these products and services. And we look forward to working with Dr. Shuren and stakeholders with hopes of having a legislative hearing in July. This hearing and the one year anniversary of 21st Century Cures are important milestones, but much more work remains to get the bill to the president. Along with the wealth of ideas and support shared over the last year, we have heard repeatedly that patients can no longer wait. We must get this done this year. I want to thank all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who have participated in this effort. Thank the patients who have shared their stories, administration officials, staff, and other experts. I particularly want to thank Ms. DeGette, Mr. Pitts, Mr. Plone, and Mr. Green for their countless hours and indeed partnership. Ms. DeGette joined me in Kalamazoo just this last week where we gained valuable feedback from a number of great groups, uh, innovators, medical students, community leaders, and I look forward to going to her district uh, in, the, in the next month or so. Yes, we still have work to do, but it is important to recognize the incredible progress of this past year and remain focused on our common goal of helping patients. We have a chance to do something big, and this is our time. It is Brooke and Brielle's time as well. Yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now yields to the rank ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Plone, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank you, Chairman Pitts, and also Chairman Upton, Ms. DeGette, and Ranking Member Green. Today's hearing will examine a draft release yesterday that is the result of months of discussion. It has changed significantly from the draft the chairman released earlier this year. While it is by no means perfect, it does reflect hard work by staff, true collaboration between Republicans and Democrats, stakeholders, and the administration, and I'm hopeful we can bring this legislation to a successful conclusion. There are a large number of policies in the draft and not a lot of time to cover them all, but let me just highlight a few. Most notable in the new draft, and the one that I'm most proud to see, is $10 billion in mandatory funding for NIH over the next five years. It also includes $1.5 billion increase in NIH discretionary authorization over the next three years. And this is a real win for researchers, patients, and industry alike. I believe federal funding is the foundation of our biomedical ecosystem and is one of the most promising ways to spur economic prosperity and treatments and cures for the 21st century. We also need to ensure that policies in this draft do no harm. I have said all along that broadly extending drug exclusivity will not solve the problems 21st century cures sets out to address. So I'm glad to see that this new draft includes placeholder language for a much more tailored approach at solving a targeted problem. We're going to continue discussions on how we can incentivize development of a narrow class of drugs that have been abandoned because of inadequate remaining patent life. Dr. Collins has spoken about the need to provide limited additional exclusivity for drugs that have been found to be safe in clinical trials. Even though they failed the trials for effectiveness, it may be possible to repurpose them for a different indication or for a different population for which they may be effective. If such drugs fill an unmet medical need for treating a serious or life-threatening disease, it may be appropriate to provide companies with limited additional exclusivity for companies to spend the resources needed to determine if they work. And I appreciate the Chairman's commitment to continue to discuss this policy and ensure that it is targeted to where it is needed. I do not want to undermine the balance between protection and competition that Hatch-Waxman has been so successful in achieving. Mr. Chairman, with the hard work of staff, I believe we have come a long way. However, there are other complicated policies like interoperability and telehealth which still need thorough vetting and further consideration. And I've said since I became the ranking member, I'm serious about finding common ground on important issues. True bipartisanship is critical to achieving successful and broadly supported policies. And I'm confident that this much improved collaborative process can continue. I'd like to yield now a minute to uh, initially to uh, uh, Representative Schakowsky and then 
the remaining uh, minute or so to Representative Matsui. So I yield now to the gentlewoman from Illinois. Thank you, Congressman Pallone. I want to highlight how vital it is that we provide additional funding to NIH, both mandatory and discretionary. For years, NIH has seen stagnant funding, a trend that simply must be reversed. And I am so pleased to see this legislation includes both $10 billion in mandatory spending as well as an increase in their discretionary authorization over the next three years. I also am encouraged by removal of many of the patent exclusivity provisions that were initially included in the draft released by the majority in January. Added ex exclusivity is not needed to bring new cures to patients. Lastly, I believe that um, we must have a serious com conversation about the high cost of medications, and we must do more to address this growing problem. If we are spending billions of dollars to incentivize the development of new drugs, we need to ensure that patients have affordable access to those therapies. I am drafting legislation that would allow HHS to negotiate for better price, prices on certain specialty drugs and biologics. I strongly hope that giving HHS this authority would help to ensure that our health care system can sustain the treatments that we hope to advance um, this legislation. I want to end by expressing my gratitude to all the leaders of this effort for giving the rest of us the privilege of giving real hope to millions of Americans who are longing for cures. And I yield back. Uh, Lady yields to me. Thank you. I'll <laughs> thank you for yielding. I believe in this 21st century initiative to take advantage of innovation and to get breakthroughs of cures and technology to patients faster. I believe many of us had friends or family members who was too late to it. And so we should use their courage to spur us on forward. This legislation really does serve to address the roadblocks, and we must continue to get it right. I'd like to thank Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Pallone, and Subcommittee Chairman Pitts for working with the bipartisan working group on telehealth. Technology has huge potential to both improve patient care and reduce health care costs. Our ultimate goal as a working group has been to advance quality telehealth services within the Medicare program while recognizing that telehealth can save the system money. We must continue to work with that. And critical to the efforts of both telehealth and cures is the interoperability of health IT systems, which will facilitate population health research and improve patient care. We need to continue to work on this as well. Thank you, and I yield back the balance sure, of my thanks time. Thanks, the gentlelady. That concludes the opening statements. Uh, as usual, all the opening statements of members, if you provide them in writing, will be made a part of the record. I have a UC request. I would like to submit the following documents for the record. Statements from the American Healthcare Association, Healthcare Leadership Council, Health Level 7 International, National Association of Chain Drug Stores, National Marrow Donor Program, the Premier Healthcare Alliance, the Alliance for Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System Reform, Senior Care Pharmacy Coalition, and the Cord Blood Association, and a statement from the Bipartisan Telehealth Working Group. Without objection, so ordered. We have on our panel today three witnesses, and I will introduce them in the order of their presentation. First, Dr. Kathy Hudson, Deputy Director for Science, Outreach, and Policy at the National Institutes of Health. Secondly, Dr. Janet Woodcock, Director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. And finally, Dr. Jeff Shuren, Director of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the Food and Drug Administration. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming today. Your written statements will be made a part of the record. You'll each be given five minutes to summarize your testimony. And so, Dr. Hudson, at this point, you're recognized for five minutes for your summary. Good morning, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Green, members of the subcommittee, Chairman Upton, and Congresswoman DeGette. I want to thank the members of the subcommittee and especially your amazing staff for all the work that you've done over the past year to move forward this 21st Century Cures initiative. I'm pleased to testify this morning alongside of my colleagues from the Food and Drug Administration. We work side by side every day to advance the issues that you're attempting to address in this important bill. 
How can we accelerate the pace of medical breakthroughs in the United States? How can we get cures to patients faster? Too often, patients and those who love them run out of options. We don't know what the disease is. We don't have effective interventions for them. We simply don't have the answers. Our shared goal is to usher in an era in which we have the answers and we have effective ways to diagnose, treat, and prevent disease and disability. Investments in the National Institutes of Health have resulted in dramatic increases in lifespan and marked reductions in devastating diseases and disabilities. Take HIV AIDS. When I was a graduate student in California in the early 90s, I was attending far too many funerals of friends uh, fellow classmates and family members who had succumbed to the HIV virus. Today, it's unlikely that young people will attend the funeral of someone who has succumbed to AIDS because of the remarkable advances in treatments and preventions that have been made possible by NIH-supported research. While we have much to do, this is a remarkable success story, but we need more. Today, I want to talk about a few of the areas in which your draft bill can facilitate scientific innovation and collaboration and increase efficiency through reducing uh, administrative burdens on uh, scientists. First, you have proposed to increase the funding available to support NIH research. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The research community is ecstatic to see this new provision in the bill, and we are deeply appreciative. After a number of years of reduced ability to support research and diminishing ability to pay for great ideas that are brought before us, this is a dramatic and important moment. So thank you very much. We hope that this increase in support for NIH will be undertaken as a part of broader efforts to support important programs across government. Second, the draft bill inc includes a number of proposals to enhance accountability, and we support those. That is why Dr. Collins and his leadership team are undertaking a number of new ways to enhance our stewardship of the resources that you and the American people provide. These include investments in making sure we are investing in the highest research priorities, fostering creative collaborations, and making sure that we are sustaining uh, the biomedical workforce. Third, I think that we can all agree that scientists should be spending their time doing science and bringing cures to patients. Unfortunately, researchers are spending too much time filling out forms that benefit no one. Your effort to streamline the ability of NIH intramural scientists to attend scientific meetings is one important step. Uh, NIH is taking additional steps to reduce burden on our grantees, and we appreciate the inclusion in the draft bill of a uh, uh, exclusion for science, scientific research from the Paperwork-Inducing Paperwork Reduction Act. Fourth, on dis data sharing, and you mentioned this, dissemination of research findings is fundamental, and we are using all sorts of new technologies and opportunities to make sure that the, the results of our investments in research are made available to other researchers, to patients, and to providers. Uh, we appreciate very much the inclusion in this draft bill of a specific provision that allows the NIH director to require a data sharing for NIH-funded research. And fifth and finally, um, while we need to ensure the rapid, unencumbered sharing of data from biomedical research, we also need to protect the privacy of those who volunteer to participate in biomedical research. Although we have taken a number of steps to protect research participants there's ways in which Congress can be of assistance. Specifically, a statutory change establishing that individual level genomic data are confidential would provide research participants with more robust privacy protections and enhance public trust and confidence in medical research. This will be particularly important as major new research efforts, such as the Precision Medicine Initiative, move forward. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. NIH looks forward to working with you and your staff as you continue to remove the brackets um, from the draft bill, and I welcome your questions. Thank Chair, you. thanks to the gentlelady. Now recognizes Dr. Woodcock, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sherin will be presenting our draft oral statement. Dr. Sherin? It's in the spirit of greater efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, on behalf of Janet and myself, thank you for inviting us to testify regarding the committee's 21st Century Cures proposal, 
We share your desire to accelerate the development of safe and effective medical products. We would like to sh uh, thank Chairman Upton, Representatives Pallone and DeGett, other members of the committee, for reaching out to FDA over the past many months to ask for our insights on opportunities to reduce the costs and time involved in studying new medical products while continuing to protect patients who will use those products. We also want to recognize Congress's critical role in establishing user fee programs that have led to faster product reviews and greater collaboration between the agency, companies, and our stakeholders. With your partnership, FDA has been successful in accelerating drug and medical device review times, even as FDA's regulatory review process has remained the gold standard worldwide. While working together with the Committee on the Cures legislation, we are continually cognizant of the agreements made between the agency and the industry and enacted by Congress under the Prescription Drug User Fee Act and Medical Device User Fee Act and appreciate the importance of assuring that new provisions not impede or conflict with the important ongoing work pursuant to those user fee agreements. We appreciate the chance to provide input throughout the drafting of the legislation. As we have previously indicated to the committee, we believe there are opportunities to accelerate medical product development, for example, by supporting patient-centered medical product development, encouraging development and qualification of biomarkers, utilizing real-world evidence in the review process, reducing barriers to the use of central IRBs for device trials, and strengthening FDA's ability to hire and retain highly qualified experts. We are encouraged that these themes have been addressed in this legislation and look forward to providing additional feedback on these proposals as we evaluate the details of the draft. There are also several areas that we believe require further improvement to ensure that they do not compromise the safety and effectiveness of American medical products. For example, we appreciate that the committee has been working with FDA and stakeholders to encourage the development and qualification of drug development tools. We look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure that this language does not divert from important resources, take those away from drug review activities. We share the committee's goal on advancing the development of new antibiotics through a new approval pathway focused on drugs intended for limited populations of patients with few or no available treatment alternatives and streamlining the process for updating antibiotic breakpoints. We thank Representative Shimkus and Green for their leadership on this important topic and look forward to continuing to work with the committee on the remaining issues, including the inclusion of a branding element within the labeling of such products that will alert healthcare community to these products that they are special and should be treated as such, as well as provisions related to meetings and agreements. We recognize the interest of manufacturers in communicating with health insurers about healthcare economic information and are evaluating this new language. We will provide feedback on this topic as soon as possible. We thank Representatives Blackburn and Green, as well as the committee staff, for the opportunity to work with the committee and stakeholders to ensure that medical software is regulated in a manner that ensures appropriate oversight of higher risk software to protect patient safety, while limiting requirements on other products. In many cases, software is essential to the safe functioning of medical devices used in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. Removing particular types of software from the statutory definition of a medical device requires careful consideration to avoid unintended consequences. We look forward to continuing to work together to address remaining issues, including avoiding the imposition of unnecessary burdens on the agency's effort to streamline its approach to device software that would delay rather than accelerate these actions. We look forward to providing you with additional feedback as we review this new draft and to ensuring that it meets our shared goal of accelerating innovation without jeopardizing the safety and effectiveness of medical products. The American public benefits from the efficient and expeditious development and review of innovative medical products, and the safety and effectiveness of those products depends on the high quality of the input and review of FDA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll begin questioning, and the uh, uh, I'll, I'll recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. We'll start uh, on patient-centered drug development um, for doctors Woodcock and Schoen. Patients are the cornerstone of the 21st Century Cures Initiative. Incorporating patient perspective into the regulatory process 
and the benefit-risk discussion is a pivotal change to our regulatory structure. The patient-focused drug development section builds on the work FDA started with Fidesia in 2012. And I know that both Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Schoen, both your centers have made progress incorporating the patient perspective in different ways for drugs and devices. What have you done since the enactment of Fidesia in this regard? Dr. Woodcock, we'll start, we'll start with you. <clears throat> Certainly, we've held, we're supposed to hold 20 meetings uh, they are the voice of the patient. They're um, for specific diseases, um, and we hear from patients, and it's a facilitated discussion of the burden of disease, what, what is their experience of the disease, what are the various burdens, because really there's a whole spectrum of burden in for patients. One patient's experience doesn't represent the experience of everyone who has a disease. So we hear from a spectrum of patients, and then we write a report called The Voice of the Patient, and then in some cases we have uh, issued guidance afterward on drug development, talking about, for example, with chronic fatigue syndrome, about how you would um, develop a drug for that condition. So what we've really learned is that patients are experts in their disease. People with chronic diseases are experts, and we really need to hear from them both the, the burden of their disease and also how well the treatments that exist, if any, are doing and what needs to be improved. And uh, what we've learned, though, is we need a much more structured and organized way to incorporate this input into uh, drug development. You know, and we think that what's laid out in the, in the discussion draft will really help with that. Thank you. Dr. Sharon. Well, in 2012, we put out a framework on the factors we consider in uh, benefits and risks and weighing benefits and risks in approving high-risk and innovative lower-risk devices. One of those factors that we would take into account is patients' perspective on benefit and tolerance for risk. Um, we have been working on draft guidance about how patient perspectives would be included in pre-market review and in support of device approvals. We've been working as a part of the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, a public-private partnership with industry, uh, patient advocacy groups, nonprofits, and government, and that includes NIH, on a compendium of tools for assessing patient preferences to then inform product approvals. They are also working on a framework for sponsors for what to take into consideration on patient preferences. We've also uh, worked with uh, RTI to develop a tool for assessing patient preferences for uh, patients with obesity and the treatments that would best benefit them. The results of that survey we use to inform our decision to approve the very first device treatment for obesity since 2007. So we're actually already incorporating such information into our decisions, and of course, we attend uh, the, the drug meetings as well. Thank you. Now, the next question for all, all of you, uh, one on interoperability and uh, one on pediatric clinical trials. This legislation is based on the innovation cycle, the way medical products are developed through the regulatory system from discovery to development to delivery. Some of the fundamental problems we've identified is the challenges of working together, but the committee has identified how working together is critical for 21st century innovation. And a paramount piece of this is interoperability. Imagine a, a world where your cell phone would not work with a landline or if my cell phone did not connect with other networks. Ridiculous. Well, that's the world of electronic health records, and that is the world of health data patients with devices, such as diabetes patients, numerous devices collecting data that never get compiled or looked at by a physician. We're not using this information to innovate and empower patients, and interoperability is the barrier. How interoperability and data collection could be used at your agency uh, to accelerate the science and gain better understanding of disease is the first question, and then comment on how will a global pediatric clinical trial network help accelerate pediatric research in medical products, Dr. Hudson. So let me begin in addressing the question of interoperability. Our colleagues in the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT are working very hard at fixing the problems of interoperability and making sure that all of our healthcare providers, and we all have many, are actually able to communicate with each other and equally importantly, able to share that information and 
a, a ready way with us. I moved my mother from Texas to Minnesota in November, and I ended up carrying two boxes of paper medical records with me. Um, I hope that that doesn't happen in the future, and I think we're moving quickly to solve that problem. Certainly, interoperability for patient care is extraordinarily important, but having interoperable, interoperable medical records is also vital for research. And so making uh, electronic medical records, electronic health records available and accessible for research will be important, especially as we move forward with the Precision um, Medicine Initiative. Um, do you want to? Uh, so if you would supply in writing to us the response to those questions, I'll now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Green, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Among the provisions, uh, the draft includes key improvements to FDA's pre-market program for medical devices. I believe the most significant uh, of these provisions is the establishment of an expedited pathway for breakthrough and innovative technologies. This has a potential to increase the efficiency and predictability of the agency's review process and improve patient access. Dr. Sheeran, can you comment on the provision creating a path breakthrough pathway for medical devices? Is this complementary actions that the FDA is already underway? Um, yes, it is. So we think this is a very important provision. It essentially codifies a program that uh, we just launched the other week that we call the Expedited Access uh, Pathway Program and something we've been piloting since 2011. This is an attempt to sort of speed access to very important medical devices. It includes greater collaboration and interaction with the sponsor um, who's developing the product, but also the opportunity where appropriate to shift some data we'd otherwise collect pre-market to the post-market setting and gather it then. Okay. Uh, basic research and translational research are critical to the science advancement. Dr. Hus Hudson, we heard that certain modifications to give increased flexibility would help NIH uh, to leverage funding and advance promising research. The discussion draft includes a provision to remove restrictions on the National Center for Advancing Translational Scientists, or NCAT's, ability to utilize its authority and foster development. Can you explain how increased flexibility on the use and funding of NCATS and other transitional authority will help advance the scientific research? Thank you very much for the question. So NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translation, Translational Sciences, is our, is our newest a center at the National Institutes of Health, and it ironically has this limitation on being able to pursue uh, beyond phase 2A clinical trials. The way that NCATS works is largely in collaboration with other institutes um, at the NIH to pursue new innovative approaches to design of clinical trials um, and, and the like, and so it having this restriction on being able to move forward in um, later stage clinical trials has really limited its ability to do important research, so we appreciate very much the lifting of that restriction uh, in the draft discussion. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Woodcock, during our roundtables and hearings, we heard a great deal about the promise of biomarkers. The science is incredibly complex, and the scientific community has a wide variety of views on the issue. The discussion draft includes language on FDA's treatment of biomarkers, but outstanding policy questions need to be answered. <clears throat> We must ensure that legislation provides a clear and workable solution that recognizes the underlying science. Can you share with us your view of what additional authorities would be most helpful to the FDA to facilitate and advance the use of biomarkers and approval process? I'm not sure that additional authorities are needed. Uh, for those who, who are not experts in this, biomarkers are measurements that are made on people. And these measurements help us decide whether a person has a disease, whether a given treatment might help them or not, and also to monitor a treatment once they're on therapy. And we have thousands of biomarkers that are now used in clinical trials, but clearly the new biomarkers, the genetic biomarkers, uh, proteomics, all these new technologies are going to be very important in helping us do precision medicine and, and develop new cures. And their progress is slow, and their regulatory acceptance is slow because not enough evidence is usually generated to decide whether they're worthy of making decisions about human lives. You have to know those biomarkers are reliable before you're willing to take a chance on a human life. And so the question is, what processes should be put in place that 
help develop these biomarkers and make them robust. The discussion draft codifies some procedures that we have been in, have in place called the biomarker qualification process. And during that process, we give advice to developers who are usually consortia, because another problem is there's nobody really in charge of this. And so these consortia come together, patient groups, others come together and develop the evidence on these biomarkers. And we provide advice and about what would be needed to get them to the stage where you'd be willing to use them to make decisions about people. So I think the discussion draft has made a lot of progress and we really look forward to working with you on um, finalizing this very important issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time, but I know We'll have some other questions to submit. Uh, appreciate it. All right. Thank you, um, Chair. Now I recognize the Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, as I reflect on this uh, overall bill, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the money for the NIH. And, uh, Dr. Hudson, appreciate your, your kind words. And when I talked to Dr. Collins uh, a couple times over the last uh, week or so, he was, he was very excited. And I just want to read. Uh, we, there was a statement that Andy Van Aschenbach, who's been very helpful as well, former FDA commissioner, of course, he said, and I quote, I think it has the potential, this bill is what he's referring to, has the potential of being one of the most transformational pieces of legislation that has come along since the National Cancer Act of 71. He praised the bill for looking at the entire ecosystem of medical product discovery, development, and delivery, and figuring out how to achieve more synergy between the groups involved in basic medical research, drug development, approval, and reimbursement. And I can remember the, the first roundtable that we had in this room, of course, uh, it was Henry Waxman and myself that led the effort in the House to double the money for the NIH back in the 90s. We teamed up with uh, Paul Wellstone and John McCain in, in the Senate uh, to get it done. Had a lot of discussions uh, since then, even yesterday with Cory Booker and uh, Durbin and you know it's something that uh, Frank Pallone and Diana and Joe and we're all very much on board uh, to, to try and increase that money. Uh, the question I have Dr. Hudson for you is so is the TAP program and as you know the practice of taking away two and a half percent of NIH's research budget through the evaluation TAP section 241 of the Public Health Services Act I have to agree uh, confess, must create some difficulties when planning. Can you walk us through the challenges and added burdens that you face when dealing with a TAP and its effect on the stability of NIH funding? And would it be in the public's best interest for the NIH to be exempt from that requirement, as I understand we did in the Cromnibus piece of legislation uh, last year? Well, first of all, I want to reiterate my deep appreciation on behalf of the entire biomedical research um, uh, community and also patients for the um, increase in the NIH budget that is proposed in this bill. It is a, a welcome change and really quite, uh, quite remarkable. In terms of the TAPs, um, they are complicated. They were particularly complicated this year in the omnibus and how they were um, orchestrated. It requires somebody um, from the budget office to actually walk us through this, but it is basically we still have the TAPs, but they are rerouted into uh, NIH with a reduction in the base budget of one of our institutes, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. That's not an ideal fix for this situation. Um, w the TAPs are fairly predictable, and so we are able to base our um, projections of what we're going to be able to fund, taking into account that we know that these TAPs always come about and that we um, account for them in our budgetary and programmatic planning each year. Um, so uh, they're not unexpected. They support important programs, including programs at the National Institutes of Health. So some of those uh, planning and evaluation dollars come back to us to support important uh, programs. Do you know about what share of that money comes back? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but we can certainly provide that to you. It is a, uh, a non-trivial amount that comes back to us as uh, p and &E money for us. We're just thinking that as we try to make sure that you've got a steady stream and one that's going up, that yep. that's a, a source that ought to be, you know, I think for me, I would feel more, more uh, I just think that knowing that it's used for 
directly for, for research is, seems to me a, be a better thing. Um, Dr. Shuren, uh, you know that as we're developing legislation on a new diagnostics framework, and by the way, appreciate your help across the country as well uh, as we've developed this legislation. We believe that that new framework could serve as a cornerstone to the advancement of the provision medicine and support development of diagnostic tests. And I just want to get your thoughts and uh, continued commitment to work with us as we see this proposal through. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we would be happy to work with you. It's, it's also our hope that we can all commit that a final version on any legislation will have the support of the labs, of the device industry, of all of you, and of course the FDA as well. And I want to give you a, a backhanded comment, uh, a compliment as well. When uh, Ms. Deget and I were in uh, Kalamazoo last week, uh, the folks at Stryker Medical said very good things about uh, the role that you've been playing and appreciate uh, uh, all that you do. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, five minutes for questions. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question of, of Dr. Woodcock first. It seems to me that we're asking the FDA to take on a lot of new responsibilities in this discussion draft, and the draft would require FDA to issue more than 15 guidance documents and implement a variety of new processes. For example, the section on antibiotic drug development would require FDA to create a separate approval process for antibiotics and, and antifungal drugs intended to treat serious and life-threatening infections for certain populations. So can you talk about the time and resources that will be necessary to implement these provisions and issue these guidance documents? Well, I think there is a trade-off between putting out uh, new guidances and implementing new programs and actually getting the work done, giving advice to sponsors and reviewing applications in a timely manner. And I believe that the FDA Amendments Act, uh, which had a large number of provisions in it that we had to implement, shows what can happen. This chart shows that right after, in the green, is our performance of getting things done on time, drug applications, reviewing those new products and getting them out on the market. Immediately after the Amendments Act and for many years after, we uh, were not on time with our review work. And that was because we were implementing the provisions required under the Amendments Act, which were important, but we did not receive additional resources in many cases to do this other work. So I would say we have a saying in medicine, which is first do no harm. And it's very important, in, 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 I think, in enacting new legislation to make sure that you don't uh, break uh, what's fixed. And currently, our drug review program is really going full speed. We're making all our deadlines, and we'd like to keep it that way. Well, as you know, the current draft does not authorize any additional funding for FDA to take on these additional responsibilities. So can you talk mm -hmm. about how implementation uh, of these provisions will divert, divert resources from the work that the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research is currently doing? Well, to the extent that um, the requirements are statutory and we have to get guidances out or do other work, set up new programs in a specific amount of time, those are directions from Congress and those will come first. All right, And we do try to meet all our user fee goals and exceed them because those are the new products that need to get on the market. And for example, the breakthrough therapy, we try to get those products out the door even faster than the goals because really those are products that are going to be life-changing for people. And uh, it is no doubt, though, that statutory instructions will come first and we'll have to prioritize our resources toward getting what Congress has instructed us to do done. Well, Dr. Hudson, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hudson, with regard to NIH funding and antibiotic research, NIH funding has also been responsible for generating investment in dry development pipelines, particularly areas of critical public health need. And one such area that needs increased investments is that of anti 
microbial development, which the World Health Organization has named as a top public health threat? How could NIH use increased funding to support antibiotic research and development initiatives, including efforts to improve effectiveness and to help ensure proper stewardship of antibiotics in our healthcare system? So I appreciate the question. Certainly there are opportunities to explore new development of new antibiotics. In fact, there was recently, with the support of NIH, the discovery of a new uh, antibiotic from a, a soil bacteria, as it turns out. Um, so we certainly have opportunities to explore uh, new, the development of new antibiotics and also to explore the development of approaches to treat antibiotic-resistant uh, microbes. That is a, a serious and growing problem across the country, and we need to uh, focus additional resources on that serious concern. All right, thank you. I'm just trying to get one more question mm -hmm. to Dr. Woodcock. In addition to increased NIH funding, which has long been a priority, one of the provisions in this discussion draft that's especially important is the FDA grant authority for studying the process of continuous drug manufacturing and the conventional process of batch manufacturing is outdated, but continuous manufacturing will benefit patients and pharmaceutical companies by increasing quality and, and efficiency. Uh, Dr. Wilcock, can you talk about the difference between batch manufacturing and continuous manufacturing and what advantages does continuous manufacturing provide and what do you think or why do you think it's more widely used in this country for drug manufacturing? You have I seven minutes. <laughs> I don't know why it's seven not seconds. more widely used, because <laughs> if you think of batch manufacturing, it's like cooking. And in, instead of um, having like a little cake mixer, that you have a gigantic cake mixer, and then you take all that stuff and you put it into some other machine, and that's the, what they mean by batch. So you do one operation, then you transfer it to another operation, then you transfer it. There's a tremendous amount of waste, and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for not getting things right when you do this mass mixing and so forth, and you want to get it into little pills at the end. So continuous manufacturing at its best, you take the ingredients at one end, the, the chemicals, and you make the active and then add whatever else you're putting in a continuous stream. So it comes out at the end um, all done, one end to the other, and you can measure it carefully. Um, each tablet, you can measure whether you made it right or not by computer. And so um, the, this is the future of drug manufacturing. It's much more efficient. It also can bring manufacturing back home because there's uh, no reason to do that all around the world um, like there is now with these gigantic factories that are needed. So this cannot be accelerated enough, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. Now, Recognize the Vice Chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for a question. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Shuren, I want to say thank you to you and your team for working with my team and also Congressman Green, as he rep uh, mentioned earlier, on our uh, Software Act, which is a part of this legislation. We think we're in a better place on that, and uh, we thank you for your participation. Dr. Hudson, I want to come to you with some questions. Uh, the Cromnibus that we passed last December required NIH to do an NIH-wide strategic plan. I want to know where you all are in that process, when it's going to be completed, and are you incorporating some of the elements we're discussing today? Thank you very much for the question. So we are, in fact, uh, in the process of developing that strategic plan. We have uh, put together a, a group of NIH leaders that includes um, some of the uh, directors of the institutes and centers across the NIH who have begun this process. Uh, the Cromnibus requires that we complete this strategic plan by December, and we intend to uh, meet or beat that deadline. We're excited about integrating the overarching strategic plan for the National Institutes of Health with the strategic plans that are already required and provided by each of the 27 institutes and centers, and so those will be uh, linked together in fundamental ways. Uh, we appreciate some of the modifications that were taken into consideration in the revision of the discussion draft, uh, removal of some of the more um, onerous uh, requirements for the strategic plan and related provisions, um, but we are well on our way and look forward to, to sharing that strategic plan. Wonderful. With you we look forward to getting it. We think it's an important part mm -hmm. of what we are trying to do through the Cures 
legislation that we be focused and strategic and that we set some goals. And uh, also, we think that accountability and transparency is an important part of this process. And in that, uh, we want to make certain that you all are prioritizing your spending. And so as you go through this process of developing that plan, that's something we're going to be looking for. And I wondered, as we were looking at this, as you look at your spending, do you look at portfolio analysis and conduct that? And you want to speak to that for a second? I do. I do. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the interest. And we have uh, been looking very carefully, in part because of the constriction and the available budget for the NIH, it's even been more important that we make sure that we get as much value of every dollar that we invest as possible and that we are investing in the right opportunities to address the, the challenges that face us in translating basic science into translation into the clinic. Um, so uh, we have uh, are in the process of enacting a series of stewardship reforms to make sure that we are looking carefully across the portfolio. And of course, we have the technologies today to be able to do that. It used to be with paper records. We couldn't really do that. Now with the press of a button and some new nifty tools, we can look across and see what are we funding in a particular area? What are other government agencies funding in a particular area? And where are there opportunities that we need to uh, focus more attention on? So those are great opportunities that we are looking at to make sure that we are spending all of our dollars very wisely. Yeah. I was recently at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital in Nashville, and we were uh, discussing a little bit about uh, some of the childhood diseases in research. So. Talk to me about what you're doing with uh, children as you look at this portfolio analysis about uh, children benefiting from the cures and the scientific advances that are there through NIH funding. So we're going to be going down to Vanderbilt at, uh, later in the month of May for a working group meeting on precision medicine. We're really looking forward to that. Um, so we spend probably 10 percent of our budget focused specifically on pediatric research. That doesn't say that kids are not included in other studies, but about 10 percent are directly focused on okay, children. Now let me ask you this. Yeah. I am under the impression that you all do not have a, a method to track all children in all studies. Is that correct? So we do have mechanisms to be able to um, know that children are or are not included in studies. It's a question okay. that's asked of applicants in the grant application. We also have means of being able to uh, follow whether or not children were or were not included in trials in the course of progress reports and in clinicaltrials.gov, which is now being upgraded and um, put, uh, implemented in full force, there okay, is a my requirement. My time is expiring, and I want a fuller answer on this, and I know I look you would like to, to give that. it. Yeah. But I, I think that what we would like to do is be sure that you have a better system for tracking children so that they are included in the appropriate studies, and uh, I would look forward to working with you on that, and I yield back. Mike Chair, Clark, thanks, thank gentlelady, and now I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. appreciate the testimony uh, today, and I want to congratulate uh, the members who have been working on this piece of legislation for some time now, obviously making uh, tremendous progress with it. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on what um, Representative Pallone was asking about in terms of the, the resource um, challenge potentially for the FDA, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Shuren. Um, obviously, I don't have the handle on the, the inner structure of FDA that you do, but just conceptually, I imagine that there's basically um, a main review process that exists, and then what seems to have happened over the last few years, for understandable reasons, is we keep pulling things out and creating priority reviews and expedite, expedited processes and so forth. Um, and I wonder if there comes a point at which if you've kind of expedited every last part of what the original main review process was that you've kind of slice the agency up into so many little component parts um, that you would stand back and look at it and say, well, if we'd just gone ahead and expedited the overall main process, um, 
we probably have a more efficient allocation of resources and we might even have faster review in place. So could you just comment on sort of if you take this out to, to the nth degree or to its logical conclusion in terms of constantly expediting what you have to do, whether you end up to, with some kind of um, structural distortion in the way you are supposed to operate, that even with additional resources, which I think are important, um, would mean that you couldn't get to the efficiency that you that you ultimately want to have and that the public and that we want to see you have. And it may be that that tension I'm describing is really not as much of a challenge as it appears to me, but I'd like to get your thoughts about it. Well, basically, we have uh, expedited sort of review for everything because under the Prescription Drug User Fee Act that Congress has passed multiple times and then the Generic Drug User Fee Act, we have timelines for everything, all the applications we review. And under the uh, PDUFA, we have timelines for meeting with companies and for getting minutes back to them. We track tens of thousands of different activities that we're supposed to do. And so it's all part of the review program, and the same people then have to do the uh, pediatric program that Congress passed, and they have to do the breakthrough program, and they have to do many other programs that we have that, of course, people have been very interested in. And so I think these things from the drug center point of view could be accomplished with adequate resources, but we are at the point where we add more programs on with the same people trying to implement them, and we'll slow the whole thing down as happened in 2007. Okay. So it's a, it's a similar situation on the device side, and that's not a criticism about good things people want to do. It's just being recognizing the fact that our people are people, and they have a lot of work on their plates, and we have commitments to meet, and the more things that get piled on, the more we're set up for failure. It's one of the reasons why I deal with a high turnover rate in our review divisions and in the center because their workload is high and the more that goes on, the more challenging it is. You know, when we looked at our budget, what we get for our budget authority for, for this year uh, compared to 10 years ago, even though there were some increases and none since uh, 2011, um, if you factor in increased inflation and mandatory pay increases, our purchasing power today uh, is the same as it was 10 years ago. But our responsibilities went up and our only real increases in funding come from industry they pay for it but they pay for services they get in return not for the other things we do and we're happy we're excited that NIH will get more support but all those great things don't get forward out to the market and those assessments on whether they not they're safe and effective unless we're in the position to do our work well and the other I guess the, the bottom line issue is that this effort for expedited review and processing of things creates expectations on the part of the public. And if you can't meet those expectations because of uh, resources, then, you know, you end up creating a more kind of cynical uh, uh, public as a result. So I think it's really important that this resource piece be, be addressed and be robust. And with that, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the Chair Emeritus of the Committee, Mr. Barton, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask my questions, I want to compliment you and Chairman Upton and Mr. Uh, Mr. Pallone, Ms. DeGatt, and others uh, for this discussion, for this draft that we've released yesterday on the 21st Century Cures. It's literally transformational. Um, Health care has been a priority of mine in the time I've been in the Congress. Um, I helped lead the effort to reauthorize the uh, NIH back in 2006. I've helped in bills to reform and, uh, the FDA. Uh, but I would say this piece of legislation, if it goes forward, and hopefully it will, uh, will be a landmark not just for this Congress but for many, many Congresses. So I want to compliment you and all the people that have worked on it. I am very, I'm extremely pleased uh, with what's in the draft. Now, there's some things that are not that I wished were. I had hoped that uh, my Ace Kids Act, which is bipartisan, bicameral, with over 120 co-sponsors, uh, was in the discussion draft. It's been deleted from this draft. Uh, I hope to have discussions about that and perhaps get a hearing just on that p 
piece of legislation because it's certainly worthy of being included or moving as a standalone bill. Uh, Dr. Hudson, you're the deputy director. Um, I spent quite a bit of time with the director, uh, Dr. Collins, out at the Milken Institute this past weekend in California. I was on a panel with him Monday morning. Um, so I'm, I've, I'm very pleased that if he couldn't be here today that you are here. Um, I'm going to ask you some specific questions about what's in the draft, and hopefully you can make your answers uh, uh, succinct uh, so that we can get through a number of questions. Uh, the discussion draft creates a um, review, uh, a new review panel called Biomedical Research Working Group to identify and provide recommendations to the NIH director on ways to reduce the uh, overhead burdens. Uh, you have existing at NIH a scientific management review board which is already set up, already established, and basically either is doing or could do the same thing. In your opinion, uh, could the scientific management review board that already exists uh, do the function that the new biomedical research working group is tasked with doing in the draft? So it's <coughs> certainly a possibility. Either the SMRB could undertake this review or a working group of the SMRB could un undertake this task. Similarly, it could be a working group of the advisory committee to the director. Um, there's also a National Academy of St uh, Sciences study that has just been undertaken to look at scientific burden. This is a important administrative burden on scientists. This is an important problem we need well, to Well, I'm certainly not opposed to, to there being a review of biomedical research, but in my opinion, to create a brand new group doesn't make sense when, as you've just pointed out, you have several groups that are already in existence and the overhead's there, the staff is there. We could just give them that task. Um, the draft has a creation of an innovation fund that it funds at $2 billion uh, for five years. Again, I support the concept. Um, in 2006, we created the Common Fund and we set a minimum of 1.8 percent, which is about six or seven hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, that common fund has done great work, but it's never been increased in funding. It's, it's stayed about 1.6 to 1.8 percent of the budget. It's authorized up to five percent. Uh, in your mind, could not we put this two billion dollars that we've earmarked for the innovation fund and put it into the existing common fund because that was the whole purpose of the common fund, which was give the director the, the ability to move money where it would do the most good. So the common fund has been an amazing asset for the NIH, and I appreciate you having created that in the 2006 Revitalization Act. Um, the uh, in innovation fund that is proposed in this discussion draft does include $2 billion and has two specific purposes and one other purpose that's uh, yet to be defined, and we look forward to working with you on that. Um, the, the specific part of the innovation fund that I think is important is that it permits the distribution of those funds to the institutes and centers for innovative research. And so I think that we need the ability to be able to funnel those funds to important opportunities across the institutes and centers. Okay. And finally, my last question, the discussion draft creates a biomedical, I mean, in the discussion draft, it's not discussion, it is a draft now, a bill. <laughs> we, it requires each institute director to, to to look at biomedical research at the institution. Congressman Harris, who's on the Appropriations Committee and myself, have a bill that creates a biomedical research officer at OMB because OMB looks at all the agencies. Which approach do you think is better? Letting each institute director do this review or having somebody at OMB who looks at all the agencies and that's their only job? So I think that we need to have scientific decisions made by people with scientific expertise who have a focused disciplinary um, uh, background. So I would prefer that those kinds of decisions remain at the NIH. Um, the institute directors and their advisory councils have an important responsibility to not just consider the priority score that comes out of peer review, but also to consider other factors. And we are making sure that uh, those best practices are shared across the institutes 
and okay. uh, adopted. That's not the answer I wanted, but I got two out of three. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to declare victory and turn it back to the chairman. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin my questions about specific provisions, I would like to reiterate points my colleagues have made about how critical it is that we adequately fund agencies to do all the work that we expect them to do. I'm pleased that we're able to include both strong discretionary and mandatory funding streams for NIH research in this legislative draft. I urge my colleagues to provide similar financial support for the FDA as we move forward. We expect the FDA to make sure that our food and our drugs are safe and effective, and it's our responsibility as members of Congress to ensure the FDA has the resources to do so. There are several provisions in this legislative package that would help patients with rare diseases. I support the idea of incentivizing the development of new and existing drugs that make a difference in patients' lives, especially rare disease patients who may not yet have the treatments or cures that they need. However, I'm cautious to balance the incentives for development with the ability for generic competition to come on to the market as that is a key aspect of drug access and affordability. This bill isn't perfect and there are many pieces that still need to be worked on, but I would like to highlight a few pieces that have the potential to really get at the goal we're all after an effective and balanced way. Dr. Woodcock, as you know, patients with life-threatening conditions are often willing to try riskier treatments than other types of patients. The FDA has the expanded access program to increase access to experimental drugs for these patients. 21st Century Cures includes a provision based on the Andrea Sloan Cure Act, which I co-sponsored with my colleagues, Representatives McCall and Butterfield. Dr. Woodcock, can you comment on FDA's expanded access program and how the related provision will help patients who seek increased transparency in the program? Well, currently, patients uh, in, in the United States can get access to investigational drugs if their doctor applies to the company. FDA facilitates these interactions and rarely, rarely turns them down. So thousands of patients, a 1,000 pa uh, patients or patients every year get expanded access. However, there isn't transparency on pub, uh, company policies on whether or not they will be providing such access and, and how. And so the bill does um, urge companies or uh, to post a policy so that people would know. We think that um, having a point of contact also would be helpful because sometimes we don't know who to call to find out uh, how to arrange expanded access for a patient. So we, we believe that transparency would be helpful and we believe that um, in our conversations with the community that uh, entities will step forward to help broker those connections between the healthcare professionals and the companies so that um, there's much more transparency in this. Thank you. Dr. Hudson, a part of seeking cures for patients should include collecting data about their conditions and current treatments in order to better understand their diseases. A couple of provisions of this package would enhance data collection. I won't ask about the neurological disease surveillance system for diseases like Parkinson's and MS since CDC is not here as a witness. But surveillance is an important public health function and I support that provision. Dr. Hudson, can you describe the idea in Section 1123 to establish a partnership between NIH, FDA, industry, and academia to establish or enhance an IT system to manage data on the natural history of diseases, especially rare diseases? So I believe that uh, section actually provides the authority to the secretary. Um, and so it will be up to her to make the decision about how that's implemented. And I'll turn to my colleagues at FDA to weigh in on this as well. There are a number of ongoing activities that provide information, especially about rare and neglected diseases, both through the National Library of Medicine and through the Office of Rare Diseases at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And what I'd like to do as we move forward with this um, bill is to make sure that these new um, uh, information systems 
are compatible and synergistic, in fact, with existing systems so that we don't end up having many, many different places for information about rare disorders so that when people are encountering a situation where they have uh, a, a, a child, for example, without a diagnosis, that they don't have to go to multiple places to find the information they're looking for, but can readily find Could it. Could I just want to ask, how would NIH and FDA work with non-governmental organizations like NORD to incorporate existing disease registries? Go ahead. Yeah, well, we are very interested and, in, in fact, have been working with NORD and have talked to um, other stakeholders as well. When planning a trial of a new uh, intervention into a rare disease, you have to know what happens to the people or you can't make a plan. Sure. And that's why we need to collect data over time on people with very rare diseases and what happens to them. And so we are very interested in these tools that will help patient groups actually collect the data and um, have a repository so we can plan trials better and developers can uh, understand what they need to do. Right. Well, thank you very much, and I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the vice chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Sharon, um, the provisions of cures is, are both big and small, and they're all were created to improve the way we develop access to cures. One, one provision which I've championed is Section 2218, which seeks to create more clarity around the CLIA waiver process for both the benefit of industry and for the FDA. Can you tell me your thoughts on the benefits of clarifying the CLIA waiver program? No, we think um, we had put out guidance in 2008 to attempt to provide greater clarity, and we understand there really is more flexibility out there for what companies can do, but we haven't provided that sufficient clarity, both for them and, and quite frankly, for our own staff. So we support uh, moving forward to update that guidance and provide that level of clarity and, of course, work with the community on a final product. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. And, and Dr. Woodcock, um, uh, matter of fact, um, Mr. C Congressman Plone kind of got into the continuous manufacturing, and I'm a manufacturing background, and so we're looking at this as we're moving forward and going from batch to continuous if it's efficient, and it seems like that would develop naturally through the, the marketplace. But my understanding, and so I asked that question, is the regulatory uncertainty is, is what authority you have to grant and what authority uh, the, the manufacturers have if they change, does that change the whole process? So we put a provision in to have a grant program to invest in. So it's not just happens just like the marketplace outside because of the regulatory process. So why is it important that we invest and why, do you, why is this necessary to move to a more continuous manufacturing program? Well, there have been many factors that have led to this industry making such valuable products, actually having its manufacturing processes not be state-of-the-art. And some of that has been regulation, because the old manufacturing processes are so uncertain because of the nature of the bulk uh, efforts that they're doing. Uh, they are very strictly regulated, and any changes the manufacturer, any substantive changes, they have to apply to us and get approval and so forth. And it takes quite a while, not necessarily us, but uh, doing all the documentation. And so that has been one factor that has held back innovation in this area. Another factor, though, is that uh, these products, I think, are so valuable, but I don't think the industry, in, until recently, felt manufacturing was a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And so the R&D people got all the glory, and the manufacturing folks were told, just get the product out the door and don't change anything. So now, um, because of various changes, uh, that has, that's altering. And uh, we are seeing applications with continuous manufacturing, and we're working with companies. We are not a barrier, but we need more of an academic base in this to feed ideas into the manufacturing sector. And that's where we would like to uh, provide more, um, more grants and so forth, more funding of, um, of some sort to enable um, academia to contribute to this revolution. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that answer. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, while representatives from CMS are not here today, I do believe it's important to touch on an area that will be addressed in cures for which more work needs to be done. The national and local coverage discrimination process within CMS are the processes whereby new technologies gain entrance to the Medicare program. And I've heard numerous concerns about the current processes 
specifically for LCDs that need to be addressed. And I certainly uh, deeply appreciate the bipartisan support for the narrow provision that is included in this bill. However, I believe there is still more to be done. And I plan on gathering more information on this topic and working with stakeholders to gather more ideas on ways to improve the LCD process. I look forward to working with the committee and the administration as I move forward. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses um, for your testimony today. Thank you for coming. I also want to thank Chairman and, and, uh, of the subcommittee and ranking member and Chairman Upton, uh, Mr. Plum, Mr. Deget, for all of their hard work in bringing this bill um, to this place where it is. It's obviously uh, undergone an awful lot of work. And um, from somebody in Massachusetts who's got uh, <laughs> a vocal constituency that is very much looking forward to uh, the movement of this bill through. Um, excited to see the progress and obviously uh, a lot of work that still needs to be done. Uh, but I wanted to focus a little bit, if I can, um, back at um, funding mechanisms for NIH. And Dr. Hudson, maybe uh, to start with you. Obviously, federal investments in medical research uh, have and continue to transform healthcare, advancing new treatments, therapies, and screenings. Nowhere is this more evident than at NIH. In fact, the 2011 health affairs studies found that nearly half of all patents for new drugs cite public sector patents or research in their ap applications. Increased investments in NIH yields groundbreaking research, fuels industry, and serves as a foundation for this nation's greatest scientists. Funding has obviously stagnated for years. Uh, and as I indicated, this is a huge, not a, <laughs> certainly not a week goes by and often not a day goes by when I don't have constituents that come into our office and indicate that this is a huge priority for uh, Massachusetts. Thrilled to see the increase in funding that is included in this bill um, and wanted to dig in a little bit to your thoughts around the innovation fund. So first priority there is precision medicine. Um, which, again, from Massachusetts, we've got some great companies that are developing life-changing precision medicines to treat cancer, cystic fibrosis, gaucher disease, and just to name a few. There's a lot of progress there, or promise there. I think we've got to work through some still challenges as the process goes forward. But I was hoping you could dive into the precision medicine funding mechanisms a bit. Another priority there is young scientists, which, again, comes on a daily or weekly basis to me from our hospitals and, and provider communities saying that they're losing young, talented scientists to other industries or even to other countries. Wanted to see if you could touch on that. And the third piece that I, I know it, it might be a bit premature, but is that other bracket. So what do we think other might mean? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you can flesh that out a little bit, I'd be grateful. Thank you very much. So on precision medicine, we are still in the early stages of trying to really um, sketch out a specific plan for the national cohort part of this, in which we want to invite a million or more Americans to share with us, share with researchers their health information, genomic information, environmental exposures, behavioral information, and the like. And uh, patients are eager to do that. They want to make sure that the best um, information is made available to advance their health and th that of uh, their families and, and other Americans. Um, so that plan is being developed. We're really excited about it and hoping to use um, new innovative mechanisms of being able to fund that research and also um, leverage the resources of others in the private sector to do some uh, uh, collaborative work together. Um, on uh, emerging scientists, uh, this is a substantial problem. We need to reach sort of an equilibrium in the workforce pipeline so that we can attract new investigators in. Certainly young people are going to see this uh, $2 billion mandatory funding stream as an opportunity uh, to, and uh, encouragement to stay in and, uh, do, and dig in uh, and stay with the biomedical research enterprise. Um, and then in terms of that other category, which is intriguing, and we haven't had a lot of opportunity yet since it's only been out uh, for 24 hours to talk about it with the leadership at NIH. But I think um, initial uh, considerations are we'd really like to be able to make sure that we're funding uh, innovative, investigator-initiated research. The best ideas come from the best brains across America, and we don't necessarily anticipate what those ideas are going to be until they come before us. And right now, we're only paying 18% uh, of the grants that come, uh, come to us. And we know we're leaving great science unfunded. And so being able to pay more of that good science would, might be a priority, as well as the brain initiative. I've got a minute left, and so I, yep. I wanted to get a, a brief discussion from, from the rest of the panelists as well. You, uh, Dr. Wilcock, I think uh, indicated that basic tenet of do no harm. We are putting um, a lot of exciting opportunities at uh, your doorstep. 
do you, as contemplated, does FDA have the resources to actually make these transitions and make these investments as effectively and as efficiently as possible, particularly when part of the challenge, at least that I hear again from my communities back home, is how long it takes to get some of these drugs and devices approved? Well, um, I think we're very stretched. I think we're, we're up uh, against the wall always. Uh, we, we are always asked to keep doing more with less. We do not take a long time to get things approved. They take a long time to get developed. And it is our advice uh, that is so important, and that would be one of the first things to go, uh, because that's more discretionary. Uh, but the, it's been shown that we can cut years off of companies' development time by giving them, if they come in for timely advice, and we, because we see across the board all the development programs. But yes, we are very stretched in our resources. And of course, some of the hiring um, and uh, assistance um, that is contemplated in this, uh, in this draft is, um, would be helpful as well, because we're also below our ceilings. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sherman. Sure, apologies, but I'm over time. So thank you very much for your testimony. Sure, thanks, thanks for the gentlemen. Now, I recognize Chairman, the gentleman you. from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it's been, since, it's been a long time since uh, Mr. Green was asking his questions, but there, there's one point of, of what he was asking that I just wanted to build upon in the uh, subtitle K. Uh, so, and, uh, and Dr. Sharon, can you tell me the types of resources contained with the priority view for breakthrough devices section of this bill and how important they can be to the FDD, FDA and industry when seeking approval of a breakthrough product? So we do think this is an important program. It's something we had launched. Um, it can tremendously help important technologies getting to market and getting to patients, but still safe and effective technologies. Our challenge will be having the people to do this work. We know from piloting the innovation pathway in 2011, it requires a lot more people to do it. I think uh, Janet and her program on the drug side found it requires a lot more people to handle breakthrough drugs. When we proposed our program, we said we would do it resources permitting because we do not want to jeopardize the commitments we made under the User Fee Act or the other work we have to do. With the statutory provision, the challenge we have is this is mandated. We have to do it, and the law says so. And um, we are concerned that when we move forward on this, we will not have the people to succeed at all the things we have to do and the things that are important to do um, for patients. So in going to um, uh, subtitle L, which contains a number of regulatory improvements for both the FDA and industry, uh, for instance, Section 2201, the third-party quality system assessment can lower the burden on both FDA and the industry when such actions are warranted. I'm wondering if you can spend a few minutes and tell us how the FDA sees this section improving the cures delivery cycle. So this program is, uh, pertains to modifications that are made to um, high-risk uh, devices under a PMA and moderate devices under a 510K. And it looks at a subset of modifications that if we had assurances, the company had what we call a, a good quality system. It's essentially their system for designing, making changes, supplier controls, manufacturing, that uh, we would not need to see those modifications. We could rely on a third-party assessment of that quality system for those device types. And we think that would be very helpful to industry. We looked at it, will this be an efficiency for us? And it turns out probably not, and here's why. It will cost us money to set up the program and maintain it, that the people that go out training the third parties and auditing them. At the same time, we might free up some of the work we do in reviewing these submissions. They tend to be the work, less work for those kinds of submissions for modifications. On the other hand, we lose all of the user fee revenue we would have gotten. So when we crunch the numbers, this may actually cost us money. We still think if we can work this through, it could be a very good thing to do, but we have to be cognizant about the resource implications. Thank you. That, that's, that's very helpful. Um, yeah, and for the uh, chairman and uh, the ranking member, uh, I know Mr. Green and I are pleased that ADAPT language in the, in the uh, draft is in, in this current draft and give, give credit to Dr. King Green, former member who was really uh, 
pusher of that in the last Congress. Um, and I've been pleased to take a lead with Mr. Green on this on this process. Uh, it is reported, um, as you know, over 2 million Americans each year get sick due to antibiotic resistance bacteria and tens of thousands die as a result. And I can go over all the stats. We all know them. Um, I guess getting just to the question, um, it's really, I, I still, even though I'm happy with the draft, there's still, I think, a, a need if we want to respond and we want to span immediately and more appropriately for um, continued incentives. So, um, Dr. Woodcock, would you want to speak on that issue? Yeah, there's probably, we, we probably can't do enough to get this uh, situate this crisis addressed. Uh, we're doing uh, m more under gain. Gain was very helpful. We thank you. This the we think that uh, a um, limited population approach will be very helpful as an incentive because it re it has fewer uh, patients and fewer costs associated with it, and it will be faster. Um, we still believe, of course, we don't think we need a new program. And we would really like to see a logo or some kind of statement in the label. However, even if uh, this program is enacted, I think it will attract investment because it's a very limited development program. And so the bar is lower. However, I, I don't know that that will be enough. So, Mr. Chairman, so you're, you're saying probably additional incentives might be needed? Well, we, we, we can't do enough to address this crisis, in my opinion. So you're saying additional incentives might be needed. <laughs> Chair, thanks the gentleman. And now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling the hearing today. Uh, I'm very pleased with the progress on the 21st Century Cures Initiative uh, by the committee and want to thank Chairman Up Upton and Ranking Member Plone and my, my good friend, uh, Congresswoman DeGette, uh, and Congressman Green and, and uh, Chairman Pitts as well. I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, one of my top priorities as a member of Congress has been to ensure steady and robust funding for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, today, medical research in America uh, is entirely discretionary. So that means that it's at the mercy of all of the congressional budget battles and sequester, and that brings on a lot of uncertainty. And I know all of my colleagues hear the same thing from research institutes and scientists in their, their own district. Uh, we will only save lives unless we have robust funding of medical research in America. And I think Dr. Hudson uh, really said it in a very kind way, that we have a diminishing ability to pay for the treatments and cures of the future. We've, we've really fallen behind. There was a recent Journal of American Medi Medicine uh, that went into how we're at uh, risk of losing our competitive edge to other countries around the globe. Uh, and in fact, in the last two uh, the last two years, I've offered amendments in the Budget Committee to the federal budget to shift uh, medical research funding from the discretionary category into the mandatory section because I don't believe that medical research in America anymore is discretionary. This is something that we've got to demonstrate a commitment to. But I, you know, those amendments were always voted down in a party line vote, but it, the dialogue was very interesting because there was a great sense of that something needed to be done. So I think it is appropriate that it's the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Authorizing Committee that begins to take that step towards moving uh, research funding into the mandatory section. Uh, I'm also very pleased with the pre precision medicine uh, uh, portion and the innovation fund. Uh, under what's currently happening at NIH, I know 200 million of that will go to expand cancer gen genomics research. And there's a very exciting collaboration underway uh, at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, along with Ohio State and the new partners of University of Colorado, New Mexico, University of Virginia. And uh, what they're going to do is launch a database with more than 100,000 patients who've consented to contribute tissue and clinical records for research to understand cancer at the molecular level. And the, they're going to use the total cancer care protocol 
to create a collaborative environment. I know, Dr. Hudson, you had mentioned that before, and it appears you believe that this bill continues to give NIH the flexibility that you need to, uh, to move forward on those kind of initiatives. Is that right? It does, and we uh, deeply appreciate the, the new investment in NIH or proposed investment in NIH. We agree that investments in medical research really are mandatory. We must invest in medical research in order to bring cures to patients. Thank you. And Dr. Woodcock, on the precision medicine provisions in this uh, draft bill, is the same true for, for FDA? I know the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research has been actively working for a number of years with a particular focus on pushing for the development of targeted therapies. I understand CEDAR has approved 30 such therapies since 2012. Uh, the, this new section in the draft is intended to help you, but tell us, does it help? Is it counterproductive? Uh, does it need additional work? Well, the basic research that underlies understanding disease can only help in developing treatments for those diseases. So yes, uh, I think that uh, investing in, um, in biomedical research to understand diseases will generate a, a new level of understanding that will lead to more targeted therapies for a wide variety of diseases. Right now, it's, tar it's, it's concentrated in cancer, in rare diseases, and in a couple other areas. And the goal here, I think, is to make, it more, make precision medicine more broadly available by understanding the genetic basis of of these. Okay, that's very helpful. And I'd also like to add uh, uh, my uh, concern for not having the ACE Kids Act included in 21st Century Cures, and I look forward to working with my good friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Barton, to work on that. That's the uh, Advancing Care for Exceptional Kids Act to improve how we deliver care to children with complex medical needs, and I thank uh, Congressman Barton, Chairman Emeritus, for raising the issue today. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair, thanks. The gentlelady now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's great to see this panel here. Thank you so much for your valuable input. A couple quick questions. Uh, Dr. Hudson, uh, in the bill um, <clears throat> on page 65, you don't have to look it up, uh, but at the draft version of the 21st Century Cures legislation, it states, and I'll read it for you, medical research consortia consisting of public-private partnerships of government agencies, institutions of higher education, patient advocacy groups, industrial representatives, clinical and scientific experts, and other relevant entities and individuals can play a valuable role in helping develop quality biomarkers. Can you uh, give me some input on what you see as the value of these public-private partnerships as laid out in the, in the legislation for, bar for biomarkers? So there certainly are opportunities for representatives from different sectors to come together to explore what are the challenges and opportunities in being able to develop biomarkers. And as Dr. Woodcock uh, mentioned, biomarkers are really measurements of something that's going on. And those are used sometimes in preclinical research and are extraordinarily valuable. But the ones, of course, that are of highest interest are those biomarkers that are used as surrogate endpoints uh, in clinical trials that are related to drug development. And so we can certainly work collaboratively together and are. Uh, there is a biomarkers uh, consortium that involves FDA and uh, NIH and others. There's the Critical Path Institute that's involved with multiple stakeholders in looking at uh, biomarker issues, um, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, a great uh, new public-private partnership that was launched just over a year ago and that includes us, FDA, and a number of pharmaceutical companies and patient groups, is also looking at biomarkers development, especially in Alzheimer's disease. I think I'm going I'm to come back to Alzheimer's in a moment. Uh, Dr. Woodcock, um, I want to ask uh, both of you this question, too. Um, <clears throat> consortia like this. Uh, um, are, are key in biomarkers for mental illness, it seems to me. Uh, in July of 2014, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium identified 128 independent associations spanning 108 loci that are common in schizophrenia. It was a major, major breakthrough. So how will the 21st Century Cures legislation help translate some of these insights derive from this research to new medical treatments, such as drugs, to treat serious mental illness. Either of you comment on that? 
Well, certainly the, the increased investments in NIH will allow us to support additional research, particularly at the National Institute of Mental Health. And I know you have had uh, many conversations with Dr. Insel about these investments and their importance. So that will be the primary um, benefit of the new uh, tw 21st Century Cures legislation for us and, and moving that field forward. Well, I, as I've said many times, I believe there is somewhat of a gap between the basic discovery of these and what you need to, the evidence you need to generate to understand which one of them is actionable. We would really like to be able to subset schizophrenia. We'd really like to be able to do earlier diagnosis, right? We'd really like to be able to do early intervention. But how do you get from identifying these genes and actually to something you can take action on? And that is evidence generation. That's some of the things that consortia are doing. But I feel that enough of it is not occurring. Let me add to this. Um, <clears throat> You know, we're dealing here also with really alleviating a lot of pain and suffering for patients and their families. We heard from the President's Council on Science and Technology on the costs imposed by major chronic illnesses uh, like Alzheimer's. And stunningly, the uh, President's Council noted that Alzheimer's imposes a huge financial burden on America's economy with an annual cost of about $200 billion. The National Institute of Mental Illness, uh, Dr. Insel, I think he wrote it that there's about 57 billion costs also, which is equivalent to the cost of cancer just for treating severe mental illness. But those numbers are probably way low. Um, NAMI estimated that for bipolar alone, the costs were 45 billion per year. Um, and yet, uh, I'm frustrated, as I'm sure uh, NIH and NIMH are that we spend only about $900 million a year on researching mental illness, this devastating brain disease. Um, so do you see, I'd like to ask this panel, do you see this bill in helping us move forward then, and do we need to tweak anything in getting more funding, more research, more focus on these devastating brain diseases such as Alzheimer's and severe mental illness? I'll let you go across the panel. So I think that, that um, mental illnesses are particularly challenging. Um, we don't understand very much about how the brain actually works, and um, understanding the normal function of the brain and the abnormal function of the brain is going to be critical in order for us to make breakthroughs in terms of treating many of these devastating mental illnesses. One uh, opportunity and where we could certainly have increased investment is in the brain initiative in order to understand the networks and circuitry in the brain, both in the a uh, normal human brain and in the um, uh, uh, abrupt, uh, 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 misfiring human brain. That will help in a whole host of mental illnesses uh, and in uh, neurological diseases as well. And so that's an area where I think is ripe for investment. The blue ribbon panel that set forth the spending plan for that, we have not yet made those those budgetary targets, and we'd be happy to move the, those numbers up. I recognize, Mr. Chairman, our time is up, so perhaps the rest of the panel could submit the questions for the record, their answers for the record to that I'd preach. Chair, thanks. The Thank gentleman, and now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to say I, I feel a sense of bipartisan mission here, some excitement that we're standing on the, the brink of some very important discoveries. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling that uh, we seem to be in agreement and the, all the gratitude that's gone to the leaders is certainly well deserved to bring us to this, this point. Um, I wanted to um, specifically follow up on a question uh, on, the, on Representative Castor's line of questioning. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, Dr. Uh, Woodcock, given the efforts that FDA has already taken to advance precision medicine. Do you believe you need additional authority from, from Congress? Do, do you need new authority to pursue the goals laid out in the President's Precision Medicine Initiative? We, we don't believe we need new authorities um, for precision medicine. Actually, Diagnosis, you know, is the foundation of medicine. And for hundreds of years, doctors have been getting diagnosis more and more precise. And the precision medicine, we're really trying to use new molecular uh, knowledge, like gene, gene knowledge, to get even more precise. But that's sort of how drugs, drug regulation works. We figure out 
uh, what patient population could benefit, and then they're treated. And so, um, we have uh, we have been doing this. We perceive a great. Uh, groundswell of activity, we hope, we all hope, over the next few years in, in precision medicine. But it's, it's an extension of the way drugs have been used for a very long time, and we just hope to get a lot better at it. So that's, that's helpful. And as you know, there's a new precision medicine section that's in this, uh, in this draft. I believe it's uh, intended definitely to further your efforts in this, this area. Can you tell us if you think it will accomplish that goal, this new section, recognizing that it may still need some tweaking? Um, I think we all want to be helpful here and don't want to do anything that might be counterproductive. We look forward to working uh, on uh, with the uh, committee on this. The um, version that was in yesterday was changed from previously, and we need to take a close look at that, and we, we really look forward to working with you on it. Very good. Um, I wanted to, um, while we're all forward looking today, I think it, it may be helpful to just look back on what happens a little bit when we don't adequately fund um, NIH. I know that over between 2003 and 2000. 15, NIH actually lost about 22% of its uh, funding. So, um, Dr. Hudson, I know, I, I remember Francis, uh, Dr. Francis Collins talking about how we may have been more advanced in Ebola research, for example, and even some sort of uh, vaccine had we had the funding to do it. I wonder if there are other examples of things that maybe we can do now that we couldn't do because of the lack of funding. I think probably one of the most devastating effects of the budget constrictions over the last several years has been the lack of appeal for careers in biomedical research mm. for young people. So as uh, I go to scientific meetings and conferences and uh, often with uh, Dr. Collins, we hear uh, repeatedly the um, sort of chronic depression of youngsters who are questioning whether or not it's worth pursuing a career in biomedical research. And that's particularly true for MDs or MD, MD PhDs who could instead be in clinical practice uh, where there's a more secure uh, career trajectory rather than in biomedical research where the success rate right now, and we hope now to see this rise, is 18%. Uh, and so people are spending a lot of time uh, writing grants and um, not getting them funded. Um, I had uh, uh, a meal this weekend with a girlfriend of mine who I went to graduate school with who w won a Nobel Prize, and she was talking to me about how she has been um, really uh, desolated by the budget cuts and by young people now not being interested in coming to work in her lab uh, to pursue important research questions. So I think we're, we've gone from a very um, we are potentially going from a very dreary phase in biomedical research to a much brighter phase, and for that, uh, we are very grateful. I hope so. The also, start and stop um, in terms of research funding uh, makes it difficult. So I hope this is the beginning of continued funding going forward. Thank you so much. I yield back. Sure. Thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start, I just want to underscore that the interoperability of electronic health records is a top priority for me. And I know reading in the press this morning that uh, my bandwidth has been exhausted by finally achieving success on the sustainable growth rate formula. I just want to assure everyone that I have uh, good minds working in my office on this issue of interoperability, and it will remain a top priority. I'm, of course, relieved that the, uh, the Chairman Pitts and Chairman Upton, the ranking members, uh, Pallone and Green also have made a similar commitment to this issue, and it is my sincere hope to have this issue advanced by having this markup, uh, uh, but to have this issue advanced by the time we get this draft to markup. So I've talked in the past about my own frustrations with electronic health records, and here we are years later, and I'm still hearing from doctors that electronic health records fail to deliver on the promise. Patient seen in the emergency room with chest pain follows up with their cardiologist. That doctor should be able to review the patient's health information recorded by the hospital without the patient having to request that it be faxed, 
without the secondary doctor having to pay an exorbitant fee, without having to agree to use the same electronic health record vendor as the hospital. And yet many times that's the way our world is working and it's frustrating for doctors and it's bad for patients. Doctors and hospitals have invested time and money to make this switch to electronic health records. And we, in this committee, under the stimulus bill and to some degree under the Affordable Care Act, have invested 28 billion taxpayer dollars to support this transition. Developments in the technology have far outpaced the capabilities of the systems. This is not a tech problem. This is a bureaucracy problem and we can fix it. So Dr. Hudson, let me ask you, if people were, were able to seamlessly share their health information in electronic form with the National Institute of Health, would it improve researchers' ability to identify patterns in diseases? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being succinct. Um, another issue, and I'm very committed to protecting First Amendment rights of clinicians to share and receive truthful medical information. The current draft, in my opinion, must do much more in this area. So Dr. Woodcock, given that approximately half of the medicines prescribed to treat cancer patients in oncology centers are used by physicians off-label, and over 60% of pediatric prescriptions are off-label, wouldn't it benefit patients if the manufacturers of these medicines could provide physicians and payers with the most up-to-date, truthful, non-misleading information about drugs with no delay? Well, there are multiple pathways, of course, that clinicians can get information from manufacturers. They can talk to them. Uh, their scientific meetings, their publications, and so forth. Um, and there are downsides to establishing essentially a market for a drug um, before it has been tested for a given indication. Now, for economic purposes, for um, payers, formulary committees, we understand that um, a free flow of information is needed, and we, we look forward to working. Right. There are First Amendment considerations here, um, but it seems like the FDA should allow a company to distribute to a physician the peer-reviewed New England Journal of Medicine article, for example, that may have been important in getting this product approved in the first place. You know, before my time has expired, and I do really do appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you holding this uh, hearing today, and, and I appreciate our witnesses being here, and I, I know it is a long hearing, and to some degree we're all somewhat long-winded and drawn out. Um, on the issue of precision medicine, on the issue of personalized medicine, I, I, I do worry that some of the things that have happened recently, within the last year and a half, have kind of put the brakes on what should be happening in that space. And specifically, I'm referring to genomic information, which should, why is my genomic information that 23andMe has, why is it locked up and why is it locked away from me now? Why can only I get ancestral information from 23andMe? It's great to know my mother was descended from Jesse James. I always ex suspected that, but actually it would be more useful if I knew whether or not I was at risk for multiple sclerosis, for example. And on the concept of precision medicine, and we've dealt with laboratory te developed tests before, the ability of a doctor to get a more precise diagnosis is sometimes hinges upon getting those laboratory developed tests and not impeding their development. And then finally, the whole concept of medical apps. It is one that has exploded since uh, really we've begun having some of these hearings. And I very much look forward to the day where medical apps, laboratory developed tests, and consumer directed genomic information can help direct that precision medicine. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. <coughs> Chair, thanks to the gentleman. And now I recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Schrader, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Go back to uh, maybe a little more basic uh, questions uh, as a new member of the committee and stuff. Uh, what, how does uh, both FDA and NIH prioritize uh, the research, trying to juxtapose uh, that research that uh, gives the biggest bang for the greater population at large versus making sure that there are these opportunities for subgroups and breakthrough uh, populations? And will this be part of your addressing this, this bill? So the way in which um, 
priorities are selected and funding decisions are made is a combination of factors. Um, first, we want to fund only the very best, most meritorious science, and that is determined through a process of peer review, which is sort of the gold standard. But that's only one um, measure of uh, one input for our funding decisions. Another is um, what are the diseases and disorders that are most profoundly affecting um, our population? And so that certainly weighs into our considerations as well. Um, what is our existing portfolio of investments and where are there uh, potential um, gaps that we need to fill? And then lastly, um, where are there specific scientific opportunities? And sometimes that comes because there was a breakthrough in another area that shines some light on another unexpected mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. and then we need to chase after that, and we need to do that with some alacrity. And so those are really the four um, basic mechanisms, and we are able to go out to the community and say we're interested in looking in these specific categories of research. They're high priority to us. Come in with your best ideas. At the same time, leaving open the door for people who have their own ideas of the next best thing, that they can come to us with their great innovative ideas, uh, investigator-initiated research, often basic research that is vital uh, to our entire portfolio. FDA, same question. Well, for the Center for Drugs, we have really a minuscule uh, research budget. We're not really a research institution, all right? And we do testing, a lot of testing, say counterfeit drugs and things like that. We also do applied research on matters that relate to regulating drugs, like how would you establish that a biosimilar drug is biosimilar? Mm -hmm. And so we have to have scientists who actually do that hands-on in the lab, so they're capable of evaluating an application when it comes in. So both of you have strategic plans then to address how you prioritize the testing and or the, the things you actually research. Yeah, I, I could look get a, my office get a copy of that just so we have some idea of how to approach. I guess the second question would be on the uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, manufacturing opportunity. Question I have is, you know, uh, are there cost differences between that and the batch manufacturing that has been traditional within the industry? There's going to be sort of a entry cost that will be high to switch over to this technology. And so we expect that, say, generic manufacturers may not switch over for quite a while because it needs to get established. The equipment manufacturers need to have stable offerings and so forth. Once you get into continuous manufacturing, we would expect it generally to be less expensive because it has a much smaller footprint, much less waste, much, le much fewer failures and um, is higher quality, actually. So, um, but getting into it is a radical departure from the way it's done now, sure. and so we'll take uh, investment. Would the, you know, would pharmaceutical companies and device manufacturers agree with that? Well, I don't know that it's relevant to devices so much. Jeff can speak to that. But uh, yes, I think um, now the innovator industry really understands the opportunity for oh, them, sure. and so they are moving very uh, briskly into this area, whereas the generic industry, which actually supplies most of the drugs that Americans take every day, um, operates on a s smaller cost margins or profit margins, and so I think they'll be slower to enter this area. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, you know, the, the manufacturers in our country, by and large, do a very good job. Uh, we have, the, like, some of the safest drugs in the world, and uh, you and others make sure that, that that occurs, which I appreciate. So I'm just trying to get to the, the cost-benefit type of uh, playback that would be there. Uh, I guess the last question would be uh, for our NIH folks, Dr. Hudson. Uh, uh, are we, how do we, how do you work with... Uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies on the antibiotic antifungal research. Make sure you're not duplicating. They have, many of them have huge uh, R&D budgets. How do you make sure you're not duplicating what they're doing? So there is a um, network of investigators who specifically work on antibiotic uh, research, and they are closely coordinating and communicating with the private sector on where our research investments are, and I'd be happy to provide additional information on that for the, for the record. Great. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to submit for a rec the record uh, a letter from the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Parkinson's Action Network here in town regarding uh, 
the, the legislation, uh, especially regarding the integrated electronic health records with the clinicaltrials.gov, and uh, I would ask that this be submitted for the record. Without objection. Without objection, Thank you. sure. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I was pleased to see in the latest iteration of the legislation a placeholder to incentivize and advance the repurposing of drugs to address serious and life-threatening diseases, and I've been working on this for quite some time. I'm glad that there is a bipartisan agreement that this issue deserves our focus and ultimately real policy solutions as part of the larger legislation. Uh, Dr. Collins alluded to some of the challenges in bringing cures and treatments to patients during one of our many uh, roundtables last year, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. Dr. Collins noted specifically that this was a problem where compounds failed to gain approval, but researchers later discovered potential new uses for cures and treatments for patients. Uh, Director Hudson, can you give us a sense of how NIH has encountered and observed some of these challenges? through its drug repurposing initiatives? I'd be happy to, and thank you for the question. So at our newest center, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, one of the first programs that we started in that program, in that institute, and I was uh, honored to be the deputy, acting deputy director there at its onset, was a drug reuse program, and it is a wonderful partnership between a number of pharmaceutical companies, ourselves, and academic partners. And really, it is intended to take compounds that have proven to be safe in humans but have failed in efficacy or have been abandoned for business reasons, economic reasons, and companies have been um, uh, willing to share those compounds and provide them to us, and then they're offered up for academic researchers to see whether or not those molecules might actually be effective for a new use. And there was a a recent paper that was quite dramatic in which a drug that had originally been developed by AstraZeneca for cancer. A uh, researcher at Yale um, was looking at the available compounds. He had done some research on Alzheimer's and found that there was a particular kinase that was activated in Alzheimer's. He saw this kinase inhibitor that was available from AstraZeneca through our program, got it, used it in mice, um, restored uh, uh, neuronal uh, synaptic activity, and restored some memory loss in these mice models. And it has moved very briskly into clinical trials in humans. So in 18 months, we have moved a compound that had failed in cancer into uh, uh, phase two studies in, in humans. It's a pretty remarkable progress, and more uh, programs like that uh, would be very beneficial. We, we need to make sure <coughs> at the end of the day that somebody's going to commercialize those. And so we look forward to working with you on the specific provision in the bill. Uh, thank you. And I hope that uh, this is included in the, in the legislation that reaches the subcommittee, the, the committee, and, and on the floor of the House. Um, I'd like to discuss briefly a different provision of the legislation uh, that I've been working on with my colleague, Mr. Griffith, related to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, last year, a constituent of mine contacted me expressing his deep concern and frustration with clinicaltrials.gov. His young son had recently passed away from brain cancer, and over the course of his son's treatment, my constituent looked to clinicaltrials.gov in the hopes of finding a trial for his son. Not only did the site lack a significant amount of information, but also it was confusing and ultimately unusable. Uh, the legislation we've been working on aims to correct this by clarifying and streamlining the information included in clinicaltrials.gov and making the site an effective resource for both patients and physicians. And uh, it conforms to what others are already doing, and I urge NIH to support this effort and make these meaningful changes. Dr. Hudson, in your testimony, you stated the scientific community and the public expect data generated with federal funds will be shared to enable further insights to be gained. This is exactly why we are supporting these provisions and um, why I hope that this is in the legislation. Would you uh, please comment on, on your views on this? So thank you for your interest in clinicaltrials.gov. I, um, I have a particular passion about this database and making sure that it is exceptionally useful to patients and providers and to researchers. 
Um, I have to say that when I started getting engaged with clinicaltrials.gov, I learned that it was very difficult for researchers to try to submit their trials into the database. It was difficult for patients and families and providers to easily search the database. And as a result of that, we have made specific targeted investments to increase the usability of clinicaltrials.gov. We have a notice of proposed rulemaking. We've gotten comments back. We'll be finalizing those rules to make sure that every single applicable clinical trial under the regulation and all NIH-funded clinical trials are registered and their data are submitted and that that data is available. There are some specific provisions in the draft where uh, data, structured data elements are um, uh, suggested where I think they may be um, less than helpful at the end of the day. And we'd be interested in working with you to make sure that there are um, ways in which people can get the information without placing inordinate burdens on the researchers and without actually trying to box up information in ways that ultimately is less useful for being able to re retrieve it. We have sophisticated search, fu search functions. We can be able to provide this information. I think we received the same letter uh, that uh, was sent to you from your constituent, and uh, we're going to do better. Uh, thank you. My time has expired. This is an important issue, and I hope to continue to work on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. I recognize the gentlelady from California, Mr. Capps, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all our witnesses for your testimonies. I'm so pleased we are here discussing investments in critical research and innovation. I want to commend the committee staff who have worked so hard to improve the latest draft of this bill. Early on in my time in Congress, and that was over 50 years, 15 years ago, I was very proud that we were able to work across the aisle to nearly double the budget of the National Institutes of Health. I think it was a high watermark uh, for this Congress. We continually see how vital these federal research dollars are to medical innovation. NIH supports the best research in the world and has contributed to dramatically improving the lives of so many Americans. But there still is much more to be done. That's why it's so crucial that this bill provides an increase of $10 billion for NIH research. It's important that we provide the necessary support that NIH requires to continue to be the gold standard in research and, develop, and development. I have always believed that supporting NIH is one of the smartest investments that this Congress uh, can make. As we all know, NIH is driven by innovation. However, we still face significant barriers in turning scientific knowledge into new therapies and effective treatments. Last Congress, the National Pediatric Research Network Act was signed into law. This legislation was led by myself and Congresswoman McMorris Rogers, and it targeted the difficulties in pediatric de disease research, especially for research on rare diseases. The low prevalence of these diseases makes them particularly hard to research. But for those affected, a new cure or treatment could mean a world of difference. So my first question, again, Dr. Hudson, I'm kind of pick, we're picking on you today. Can, could you talk briefly? I have three questions for you. Uh, but first, uh, how the National Pediatric Research Network consortia, Consortium, described in the bill, might have an impact on the study of rare pediatric diseases or birth defects? So there are uh, a number of pediatric research centers and networks that already exist, um, uh, close to 100 different research centers and networks. And those networks already provide important infrastructure for being able to uh, do critical research on pediatric diseases, especially rare diseases. So we have newborn uh, research network. We have a number of networks that are already in place. Um, we um, look forward to uh, building this new network and making sure that it um, is uh, complementary to and not duplicative with the existing research networks that we have in place. Thank you. My colleagues have heard me talk before about a family in my district with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And you know these rare diseases affect not just the, the person who's involved, but the entire family and many times the wider uh, network of folks as well. And that's why devoting resources toward gaining better understanding of treatments of these particular diseases is so crucial to entire communities. As NIH takes on this critical research, we must ensure robust funding for this important program. That's my 
um, pitch uh, myself and my colleagues. Another question for you. We know that children also have unique health care experiences, treatment needs, research challenges. Children are not just little adults, and medical discoveries that apply to adults don't necessarily apply to children. NIH has had a policy in place for almost 20 years requiring that children be included in NIH studies unless there's a good reason not to do so. While I applaud this policy, I believe that we can do a better job of not only tracking the number of children in research, but also distinguishing between subgroups like infants and teens where there are tremendous differences. As many of you know, NIH tracks specific populations such as the number of women and minorities who are enrolled in the studies it funds, and this information is available on, on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, but uh, now, my, now my question is uh, to you, Dr. Hudson. I believe NIH should track the number of children it enrolls in studies and their ages on these websites as well, because there, there are such major differences between them. Adding to this clinicaltrials.gov could achieve, adding this to clinicaltrials.gov could achieve the, achieve the goal of more robust data uh, regarding children uh, in NIH studies. Do you agree? So uh, certainly the inclusion of the ages um, that are uh, go sought for inclusion within clinical trials right. is being included in the registration information for clinicaltrials.gov. And then when the summary data is reported, uh, the ages are also included in that, but in an aggregate form. I think we could also do more, especially with new technologies, uh, electronic technologies and data uh, technologies, to, s to extract more information earlier in the process. So when we're looking at the grant applications, when we're looking at the progress report, that we would be able to monitor in a more robust way the inclusion of children before the study is already awarded and the, um, and the trial is underway. And so we look forward to working with you to make sure that we're uh, paying close attention using all the technologies that we have. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I realize my time is up, but I have one more additional question to you, uh, Dr. Hudson. Perhaps I'll submit it in writing. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith. Five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd be happy to yield a minute to the gentlelady if she has one more question. Really thoughtful of you. Thank you very much. Uh, the question, because it follows in a line with these others, um, I wonder if you could describe how this data sharing might increase our understanding of potential differences in the way medical treatments affect women and minorities as well. I mean, the, this kind of provision uh, would help us, would it not, uh, under, better understand the effects of uh, treatments on differing populations and subsets. I hope NIH continues its work uh, to uh, include more women and minorities in clinical research as well as children and look forward to working with you. But it's just perhaps an extrapolation. And, and we, uh, we are, in fact, looking forward to being able to have these kinds of data so that we can draw conclusions of data in sets rather than individually to draw important conclusions about um, disparities in health and health outcomes right. that would direct us for future research. Um, so we have the tools now to be able to deploy to, to really um, ratchet up our attention to these issues. Thank you Thank very you. much. Now you'll back. I'm back my time. Let's, let's stick with uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. You heard uh, both the gentlelady before me and, and uh, Congressman Lance uh, talking about some of the concerns and some of the thoughts there. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I gathered from some of the comments you made back to Congressman Lance that you're not uh, completely supportive of uh, Section 1102 that deals with uh, making sure that there, there's certain data points in there. How would you improve? We certainly want to work with you on it, but we also, I feel very strongly, I know others do too, that we continue to improve this to make it uh, easier for, for patients and others to get the data they need. What, uh, what particularly do you have a problem with in 1102, and what would you think that we needed to add to it? So there are a number of elements there that, um, that the draft suggests be provided a structured data field, um, and they are pretty straightforward, and we can certainly do that. We certainly have proposed that in the notice of proposed rulemaking. We're currently uh, evaluating the 800 or so comments that came in in response yes. to that, largely overwhelmingly positive. So we're excited about that and getting a final rule um, out, and we want to do that soon. Um, in terms of the elements where we have more uh, concerns about whether or not you can actually put it into a discrete category really concerns the eligibility and exclusion criteria. For clinical trials, often the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria are complex and aren't easily definable into um, subunits. And so by 
forcing investigators to put inclusion and exclusion criteria into structured data elements may actually lose some of the wealth of information um, that we would want to have available to patients, providers, researchers, uh, research reviewers, et cetera. Um, so that's really the area that we have the, the largest concern, and we'd be happy to sit down and, and talk to you in more detail about, about that specific provision. Well, I certainly provision. I hope that we can work on that because we yeah. don't want to exclude folks, but we also want to make sure the data is out there. And, and right now, as you've heard, there's a lot of concern about whether or not the data is really out there. So we yeah. need to make sure it gets out there. Yeah. Because that's one of the things we see is very important with this and with the next section in, in the uh, draft bill, which is uh, 1121, the clinical, clinical trial data system. I mean, I, I believe the more that we can make that data available, okay. uh, the more likely we are. Obviously, you have to make sure that you uh, take away the personal identifiers, but there have been all kinds of studies that say that we can do that. Yeah. I think that means that we're going to find better ways uh, to move forward. You yeah. were talking about a, a uh, drug recently that, that there had been a failure in in one area, but it worked somewhere else. Yep. That's the kind of data I think if we can enact this section, and again, it's a draft proposal, we can tweak it, but if we can get this section drafted where we can get that information out there to as many researchers as possible and to as many people as possible, I think we're going to be able to find, uh, just like that researcher, I forgot the university, what, what, what was it? Uh, Yale. Yale, who suddenly said, hey, I think this will work over here. When it didn't work for cancer, it did work uh, perhaps yeah. for Alzheimer's. I think that's the beauty of that particular section. I feel very strongly about that section staying in this uh, bill as it goes forward because I believe that the, the more people who look at the data, somebody's going to have an aha moment, a eureka, uh, and jump out of the bathtub uh, exclaiming that they've suddenly figured out how to solve the problem. May I comment? Yes, so so um, that provision specifically requ requires that um, an NIH or the secretary contract to an outside entity mm -hmm. who would then collect patient level data from clinical trials that are supported by the NIH. It's not clear to me, frankly, that having us contract with an outside entity is the most effective way to get data available. Um, and we are already experimenting with a number of mechanisms of making patient level data available from specific programs where in the RFA we say we want to do it and then we do it. And we, there are different models that have been tried by different institutes. And I think we need to look carefully at what we're learning from that experience to, before we sort of jump into a, a statutory mandated uh, requirement for all NIH clinical trials. This is going to be a burden on our investigators and we have not yet established the value for all clinical trials as opposed to what we want to try to do is to ease, ease the burden on patients and ease the burden on those who are trying to find cures for the patient's diseases and I think it's important that uh, we move forward with the taxpayers money and make sure that as many people as possible can have access to that information and uh, my time is up so I will yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the gentleman, Mr. Butterfield, five minutes for questions. Chairman Pitts, I thank you for holding today's hearing on the most recent legislative draft of the 21st Century Cures Initiative. I certainly appreciate the hard work of members and, and particularly our staff. I look forward to continuing to work with you and our colleagues to see that 21st Century Cures uh, meets and crosses the finish line. Uh, I understand, Mr. Chairman, that our staffs have worked beyond the call of duty, and I just want to personally thank each one of them on both sides of the aisle. Uh, by all accounts, Mr. Chairman, this has been a bipartisan process. I have had the pleasure of working with my colleagues on this committee, uh, Congresswoman Renee Elmers and Congressman Gus Bilirakis, and, and even with uh, Congressman Mike McCall, who is not on this committee, but we, we all know him uh, very well, on, on advocating for our shared priorities that span political parties. I am appreciative of the inclusion of some of my priorities in today's draft, including Subtitle D on disposable medical technologies. Uh, I must say, however, that I was very disappointed to learn that H.R. 1537, 1537, the Advancing Hope Act, was not included, nor was language that would achieve the same goal. The Advancing Hope Act would permanently reauthorize the Pediatric Priority Review Voucher Program, which has proven to be tremendously successful. Since its introduction, I have received overwhelming support from biopharmaceutical innovators and over 140 patient groups and rare disease organizations who have urged this committee in writing to include provisions in, in this initiative that would make the pediatric PRV program permanent. 
And so I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that uh, these letters dated March 30th and April 13th be inserted in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, the pediatric PRV program addressed the market failures we have seen as rare pediatric disease drugs have struggled to market by creating financial incentives for rare pediatric disease drug development in the form of vouchers. The PRV program cost taxpayers absolutely nothing. Let me repeat, nothing. While at the same time helping to speed treatments and potential cures to pediatric rare disease patients who desperately need them. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope that this committee will seriously consider including legislative language that would make the pediatric PRV program permanent in any subsequent 21st century cure drafts. I respectfully make that request of you, Mr. Chairman, and to all of my colleagues. I look forward to working with you to see that that happens. Uh, I have several questions, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, and because I have an ambassador sitting in my office waiting for me right now, I will, I will submit, uh, I will submit uh, my questions for the record, if that would be acceptable. That is acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Bilirakis, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, folks, for your testimony this morning. Uh, Dr. Woodcock uh, and Dr. Shuren, uh, anticipating more combination products in the future, can you tell the committee what steps FDA is taking to re refine its current approach to facilitate the development of these innovative uh, combinations? Well, uh, we have a combination products office that uh, uh, carries out the directions of Congress in trying to figure out in figuring out uh, whether there's a drug lead or a device lead for products. The device center and the drug center work very closely together in working on these products. But I must say that the um, the statutes governing devices and the statutes governing drugs were put in place a long time ago, and they didn't really contemplate. I think the, these new products. Uh, uh, they, which is probably part of the future of medicine. And so we are working very hard to try and put these, make these two statutes congruent. Um, but, that is, uh, but that is a place um, that does require probably further discussion uh, and whether or not there are changes to be thought about to make that intersection work better than it currently does. We might have some suggestions for you. So I'd love We'd be to happy to have the Thank conversation. You. Thank you. Uh, second question, during the 21st Century Cures Roundtables, we often heard about the cures gap, the enormous gulf between uh, approved therapies and known diseases which leave many patients with no treatment to turn uh, to. Turn to. Uh, patients in the rare disease community understand this challenge, uh, where market realities often make it more difficult to develop therapies for diseases with smaller patient populations. I believe there's a great, prom there's great promise in repurposing drugs. Uh, in fact, earlier this year, I introduced the OPEN Act with uh, my colleague, Representative Butterfield, uh, who had to leave to see the ambassador. It would foster research to increase the number of safe, effective, and affordable rare disease uh, medicines for patients by incentivizing drug manufacturers to repurpose their approved products for rare disease indications by providing an additional six months of uh, market exclusivity when a product is repurposed and approved by the FDA for the treatment of a rare disease. Ninety-five percent of rare diseases have no FDA-approved treatments. My first question is to Dr. Uh, Director Hudson and, of course, to Dr. Woodcock. Can you comment on how repurposing already approved drugs may hold therapeutic promise for rare disease populations? So I think there's a number of examples where um, drugs that were initially approved or pursued for one indication have proven to be uh, effective for other indications, and in some cases those have been rare and neglected diseases. We appreciate very much your interest in this area and um, really look forward to working with you to come up with a provision that will be uh, appropriate for being able to um, actively pursue this area where there is such opportunity um, to um, accelerate the delivery of new medications for patients that really need them. Thank you. Dr. Woodcock? 
Well, I think um, we need, uh, in rare diseases, you need to understand something about the disease. And then, of course, having a, a range of therapies that you can try and, and being able to pick from those because you understand something about what, which is the example Dr. Hudson just gave about Alzheimer's. So um, obviously, there's a whole range of treatments out there, and those that have not made it to the market would expand that universe of things that could be tried. So I think as disease understanding improves in rare diseases, there's an opportunity opportunity to, to try uh, many compounds. Thank you. Uh, next question, what incentives are currently available that encourage research into rare and orphan applications and drugs that are already approved by the FDA for a separate indication? Uh, maybe for the, we'll start with uh, Director Hudson and then uh, Dr. Woodcock. So there are specific research programs at the NIH, including um, the Office of Rare Diseases, uh, the uh, therapeutics for rare and neglected diseases. There's a number of programs that are specifically focused on supporting research for um, diseases that affect a small number of people in the population. And then in addition, and Dr. Woodcock can address this, there are incentives uh, and a pull from her end as well. Yeah, the Orphan Drug Act was a very successful program that's brought many, many uh, treatments to rare diseases. And it includes incentives uh, during, uh, during the development as well as exclusivity provisions after a drug is marketed for that indication. Thank you. Uh, sir, would you like to call me as well? So um, we have a program, the Humanitarian Device Exemption. Uh, to facilitate and uh, incentivize the development of devices for rare disorders. And I actually want to compliment uh, the committee because there is a provision in this bill that will now change the cap for HDEs and I think uh, potentially provide greater incentives for device development in this area. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll go back. I do have a, uh, another question, but I'll submit it for the record. Thank you. Mm, the chair points out the gentleman's time has expired. The chair will identify uh, Recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, five minutes for questions, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, throughout my time in Congress, I've been a very strong advocate for those suffering from rare diseases. Um, I authored the ALS Registry Act and the two most recent Muscular Dystrophy Care Act reauthorizations. I know the 21st Century Cures Initiative holds great promise for the patients and families afflicted with rare diseases. If it is done well, and I'm encouraged by the progress made with the latest discussion draft, and hope that continued refinements will lead to legislation that we can all support. Um, Dr. Woodcock, uh, one of the concepts I'm pleased to see included in the latest discussion draft is a section related to biomarker development and qualification. I know that the FDA utilizes biomarkers often in making drug approval decisions, but to date there's not, I believe, a formal process to put in place to qualify biomarkers. So while I understand that FDA approves many products based on surrogate endpoints, I've also heard that the FDA has only qualified only a handful of biomarkers. So could you explain how F the FDA currently uses biomarkers and what the difference is between qualified biomarkers and surrogate endpoints? Oh, sure, although it may take your whole five minutes. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the Generally speaking, drug developers during their development program can come into FDA under the user fee agreements and they can get agreement that is more or less binding with the FDA on their pivotal trials. And those trials might include a surrogate endpoint, which is not a clinical measurement, like do you feel better, but is your tumor stable, all right? That, or it could include selection criteria, which might be by biomarkers. Do you have a certain tumor marker, or do you just have a certain genetic mutation that would match with this therapy, all right? And we can agree with that, but that whole process is confidential. And that's how most of these have gotten on the market um, for rare diseases and regular diseases, is the companies have gone through a process which is confidential. We agree with their use of the biomarker, they use it, and then the, the review process occurs. To use biomarkers more generally, a number of years ago, we started a qualification process which was considered to be different. It would be public. 
And there, we would want everyone to be able to use the biomarker, not just the company within its development program. So those are different kind of biomarkers usually. And the groups that have come into us are consortia, patient groups, and so forth, because they're looking, say, at safety biomarkers something that an individual company might not be interested in developing. But this would apply to all drugs. For example, we're going through qualification now for drug-induced kidney injury and markers of that. It'll be much better than the markers uh, we currently have if they're accepted. So um, we have actually approved 12 separate biomarkers through our qualification process. We've qualified those. But they were in five different programs. So people say we had five different biomarkers, but we've really had 12, all right? But there are many more in the process. They are not under review by us. They are, um, we're giving them advice on how to develop these biomarkers and generate the evidence needed to make decisions about human lives or human kidneys or whatever. So we have a robust qualification process going on right now. It's not in a statute. It's something that we put out in guidance and that we, uh, manage. And the European, the European Medicines Agency, we also worked with them, and they have a parallel process. We often do this qualification together. Thank you. And you didn't take up the full five minutes. So I can get in one more question. And let me, let me ask this question for anybody who cares to answer it. Um, I'm uh, fully supportive of the goals behind the 21st Century Cures Initiative. But I think that we really know it won't be possible to achieve the ambitious goals set forth in the discussion draft without providing adequate resources to the FDA, CMS, and NIH. Um, I didn't vote in support of the Budget Control Act, but I know that all of our witnesses have faced significant cuts to their budgets over the last several years as a result of sequestration. And I know that our witnesses have not had a lot of time to review the discussion draft released yesterday. But can each of you, or whoever cares to do this, share in broad terms what kind of staff and financial resources you believe will be necessary to meet the requirements outlined in this discussion draft? Um, I, we'd be glad to get back to you on that. I don't think we've had time to analyze this draft, but we do feel it will have significant resource implications for the FDA. Do the others agree? So the discussion, the draft includes a significant increase in funding for NIH, which we think we can spend in uh, effective ways, although uh, we are concerned about other agencies and making sure that as we address resource issues that we also address uh, resource issues for FDA and other agencies across government. Great. Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, five minutes for your questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today in this important hearing. And Dr. Woodcock. Does the FDA have a Twitter page and a Facebook page? I don't know whether the FDA does, but I know that my staff has does things on Twitter. <laughs> it, it's, it's my understanding that uh, they do have a Twitter page and a Facebook page. And when the FDA puts out tweets uh, about new drug approval, it's limited to 140 characters, so generally they don't include the safety information and warnings about a drug within the tweet itself. Is that, if you don't know they have one, I don't know how you can answer this, I guess, but uh, let's assume they do have well, one. Well, generally, they just a factual um, statement about the drug approval and the indication. Okay, so in a social media post, the agency does not include the information in the body of the message, which again, in, on Twitter, is 140 characters, and instead notes the new approval and then provides the rest of the safety and effectiveness information in a detailed link. So the question that I have is when regulating manufacturers' use of social media, wouldn't a similar common sense approach make sense to let the manufacturers do the same thing? Well, I think the reasoning that has been pursued is that manufacturers have a different stake in presenting the information than does the agency. A different what? Stake. Stake? Yes. Okay. In other words, that we are, you know, pre we are presenting this information um, as a factual matter from a government agency that does not market the drug. Uh, would it be unreasonable for a company to use the name of the drug and uh, approved indication in a tweet? Um, 
We have issued some draft guidance on this, and I think we'd be glad to get back to you. We are currently re-evaluating our policies on uh, regulation of drug advertising in light of recent jurisprudence, and we would be happy to uh, discuss that further with you. Well, doesn't it benefit patients in discussions with their doctors uh, to know about new medical advances, including the names of new drugs and their approved indications? Wouldn't that be beneficial to the patients? Yes, and there are multiple pathways for that information to, uh, to get out there now. Okay, well, don't you think the FDA should encourage uh, this type of communication rather than making it more difficult, assuming that the information is accurate, be able to do the same thing that the FDA does as far as getting out the information and linking to other things? Uh, we, can, we can get back to you on what, what our uh, current uh, guidance says about this on social media and what we... Um, you know, in the I, I know what your cur current guidance says, but I would like to have your word that you will work with the committee and work with my office as far as trying to put these common sense uh, approaches into place because I think that it's beneficial to the patients and to the doctors. So I just would like to have your word that you will look and work in that direction as I've been told off the record that uh, FDA will be able to. Yes, we'll be happy to work with you on this. Okay, I appreciate that, and thank you all for being here today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from New York. Mr. Collins, five minutes for your questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been a great hearing, and I want to thank Dr. Woodcock uh, for taking the time earlier this week to meet with me and talk about uh, some issues and certainly my bill on the Bayesian statistical model for adaptive trials and I appreciate uh, your support of that. I think this is 21st century, not 1950 and I think that's going to be good for all of us. Uh, I was also very impressed with your knowledge and your dedication to safely getting new drugs to market and that's what we're all about. Uh, but with all the novel and the complicated issues that we're asking the FDA to analyze and approve, I do worry that the FDA may not have the latitude in the government hiring process to hire the best and the brightest minds in the field. Now, HHS currently works under a cap on the number of senior biomedical researchers that applies to the NIH and the FDA, and also salary caps. Now, the good news is the draft that we have now uh, eliminates the cap on senior biomedical researchers. It also substantially increases the pay. I think it's to the level of pay up to that of the President of the United States, uh, which is substantially more than we have now and hopefully will make you competitive. Uh, but I do worry that there are two other barriers, and, and uh, Dr. Woodcock, I'd like you to maybe speak to those. The first one is the hiring process itself, where these are unique individuals, these are very high paid individuals with very specific uh, traits that are, are necessary for you to do the job that we're asking you to do, but yet, as I understand it, you're stuck in, in the traditional hiring process. It can take you nine months. You may not even get the name of the person you want to hire on the list. So if you could speak to that and Hopefully what we can do here is eliminate that and allow you to have, for these levels of folks, uh, the ability to hire the people you need. And then the other one is the little nuanced issue of one of these folks coming out of Big Pharma, Pfizer, or something like that, with stock. And that while they're willing to put them in a blind trust, which I'm thinking is all we should ever ask, that's not currently allowed in your hiring process, and that could stop you from hiring someone. So if you could speak to those two issues and, frankly, give us your recommendation how we can still, in this draft, make changes. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure that Dr. Shuren has the same uh, challenge, and I know it, it is, occurs across the FDA. Um, the science right now is exploding. The new products are extremely innovative. That's wonderful. But we need to have good scientists who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in industry, and industry can afford the best scientists. And um, we have great difficulty hiring at that senior level. Um, there, as you said, there are caps on... Um, 
there have been caps on the hiring authorities. There have been ca there are caps on how much we can pay the people. There are actually caps on how much we can promote, the, how much we can give them to promote them that create tremendous disparities internally in how people are paid, depending on when they came into the government. And um, we can't, we, ha we have extreme difficulty hiring uh, senior people who have worked out Side the government because of their their holdings and the conflict of interest rules and we can't use a blind trust uh, t for them to, to deal with their stock so recently I had someone who said you know I I really want to come this was a very senior doctor he said I really uh, passionately believe in the mission but I can't give up my my family's future for it to do this, and I, I just can't do it. And we've heard that again and again. So we have major barriers to hiring senior people. I would add, we have had the exact same problem. I've lost great people as a result. Uh, on the flip side, we have great people at the center, but because I can't pay a competitive salary, we are essentially are the training ground for industry. That's what the American taxpayer is paying for. And so we train them, they're terrific. They leave, they take that knowledge with them, and that disrupts our reviews. Um, it makes it much harder for us to have the good people, and it ultimately, it hurts patients. So I mean, let, let's go back to the specifics. We've addressed two of the issues in this draft, but I'm assuming you would like us to also get language in there that allows you the discretion to hire the people you need without going through the bureaucratic uh, hiring practice. And number two, allow these senior folks to at least to put their holdings in a blind trust and therefore be able to come to work uh, for HHS. Is that, is that correct? Those two would be very helpful? Yeah, I don't understand the rules about financial arrangements well enough to know, you know how that would be done, but it's clear that it's a huge barrier right now and we can't get people who are experienced from all these industries we regulate. And um, so that, and direct hire is, a kind of authority that is very helpful to us when we have it. We can just identify people and bring them in. I mean, uh, as, as you know, people are worried about the federal hiring system is worried we're all going to hire our relatives, but I don't have too many relatives who are PhD neuropharmacologists, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, so it's, and, and so there's so many safeguards and everything, we end up, uh, we can't reach the people who we need. And, that would be tremendously helpful. I'm not sure how that should be done, well, but it would be helpful. I, I think that's one of the things we can try to work through as this draft moves along. And I thank you all for your uh, testimony today. And I know my time's expired, but I still yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the eternally patient Ms. Deget for five minutes for your questions, please. Mr. Chairman, before you let her time start, I'd like to say, Congressman Deget, like Chairman Upton has worked so hard on this for the last year. I want to thank her, but her patience was shown today, not only working on this legislation, but also sitting here. And by the way, uh, former Congressman Karen Thurman, who came in with me a few years ago and, and uh, from Florida, has been here also very patiently, along with a lot in our audience. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, actually, I, I have a leg up having sat through this whole hearing today, because now I know what everybody thinks. So. <laughs> That's, that's very useful as we move forward. And I kind of consider myself to be the cleanup batter here at the end of this hearing. Um, Mr. Chairman, I really want to thank you um, and Mr. Pitts, and I want to thank Mr. Green and Mr. Pallone again. Mostly I want to thank all of our staffs who have been really working night and day. Um, and as I said, the best time to work is really the weekends because there's no distractions. So, so it's been really great. And, and, and um, Dr. Hudson, Dr. Woodcock, and Dr. Shuren, you and your staff have just been tremendous in giving us technical assistance. So um, that's the good news. Um, the even better news from my perspective is we're going to have a lot more work to do here moving forward in the next few weeks. But I think, I think the amount of consensus that we have is um, striking and positive. We still have a lot of those brackets in our discussion draft. and. Um, uh, and, and, and a lot of that is just hammering out language that we still need to agree on. 
Um, but I'm here to report that Chairman Upton is planning subcommittee and full committee markups soon. He wants to keep the momentum of this bill going. And so uh, we really are going to have to redouble our efforts to, to get everything worked out. Um, we have to get it scored. We have to find the money to do what we're going to do. I know a lot of people ask me, um, well, how can we possibly spend the money? And I said, because we need to. And I think that's the general view on both sides of the aisle. It's the general view in the patient community and among the administration. And lo, we are doing it here. Um, we still need to find a way to fund the FDA for the things that we're asking you to do. And we know that. So, so, so uh, we're going to do all of that. We also, as we learned today, need to continue to work with members on language for issues that they care deeply about, and we're going to do that. And so uh, in, these, in these last few uh, seconds that we have, I want to ask the administration, aside from resources, which we know we need to get you, what else do we need to consider that's not in this discussion draft? Dr. Hudson, I'll start with you. Well, first of all, congratulations um, on this triumph, really, to get us to today, and, and the, uh, the route ahead is really uh, exciting. Your, um, your, the, many of the issues that we wanted to have included within this bill have been addressed. The ability of the NIH director to require data sharing, for example, um, the increased level of resources. There's a number of the specific provisions that we really wanted to see into the bill that are now here. There are a couple places where we have some concerns. Uh, I mentioned uh, some of those with, the, with regard to individual patient level data sharing m mandates um, this early in the process. But um, we're very happy with where this bill Great. stands, and I'm not sure that we have any outstanding, we, probably some technical, small technical fixes, um, but nothing major that we Nothing that we've left out. No. If you think of something, let us we know. And absolutely. Keep, and, you know. and, and of course, you'll, you know, we, we look forward to having your input on those other issues. Dr. Woodcock? Well, one thing I think that I'm somewhat concerned about is that um, children with cancer, uh, most childhood cancers are very rare, and they're currently being left out of the um, precision medicine or whatever you want to call it, uh, targeted therapy revolution, because um, the way we have looked at pediatric disease is we've said it's there's a disease in adults and then there should be a disease in children. But in fact, in, in um, the targeted therapy, it's there's a pathway that's targeted in adults and then is there a pathway that's the same in children? And I think we should think about that because that's not... Um, there, there's no current way to bring that about. And, and, and I will tell you, Dr. Woodcock, that's pediatric cancers. That's an issue we've really been talking about. It's not in here because we haven't gotten to yes, and so we need help getting to that. Dr. Just Hudson. respond quickly. Yeah. So in the, um, in the Precision Medicine Initiative, there is uh, a cancer section, and in that cancer section there is a, an adult clinical trials and understanding resistance to uh, oncology drugs, and there is a pediatric section um, for that, and we'd be happy to have. So let's, um, let's do some work on yep, that. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Sharon? I'll just say on behalf of the agency, you know, we just got the draft. We're going to go through it, and we appreciate the opportunity. We'd like to put that placeholder in of coming back if there are additional things that. Uh, yeah, and that's why I said this is, is not just for the agency, but also for others. If they have suggestions of what they're not seeing in here, please uh, bring them forward again expeditiously because we're moving on this. And thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back, Chair. Thanks, the General Lady, and again, thanks her for her patience. I want to thank all of our witnesses today for your testimony. It has been a long morning, but I think it's been an important morning. I do want to remind all members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Thursday, May 14th. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.